Have you found your dream job as a developer? Or are you stuck in an unfulfilling job? On wearedevelopers.com, you find over a thousand jobs in Europe that fit the tech stack that you want to work with, and salaries go up to 130K. All you have to do is create a free profile, and you automatically get matched with jobs that fit your requirements. So what are you waiting for? Create your free profile and let companies apply to you now. Hello everyone and welcome to the RIA Developers Java Day. My name is Seyad and I hope that you are doing well. We from our end are super happy because we are coming back from the summer break and we are continuing with our RIA Developers live series. So for the ones who are joining us uh, for the first time, what is it about? We are Developers Live it is a bi-weekly conference series, a mini conference series with virtual events. And every two weeks, we dedicate one day to a specific area of software development. Today, it's obviously Java, but I will come to that back later. First of all, I would like to thank you for your loyalty. We had in the first half of the year around 20 virtual events and mini conferences like the ones today, and around 50,000 people from all around the world have joined us. We had really nice and exciting speakers who have shared their knowledge with you. So we are super excited also about the upcoming months. Today, we are going to start with the Java Day. It's one of the most popular and most used programming languages around there. And um, obviously, I think every one of us has um, had a touch point with Java in our career, in education, in, in, in school, at university, and so on. And that was actually reason enough to dedicate the first day um, to this topic. I would like to um, encourage you to, to uh, join also the discussion. You will see a live stream, uh, a, um, a chat functionality and a Q&A functionality right beside the live stream. So just enter your name and uh, join the discussion. We will have also a Q&A session after each of the talks. So we want to invite you to join. Also very important, we have a code of conduct it actually means we have to be nice to each other and treat everyone with respect. So here is a short video to explain this. Okay, having that said, let's have a bit of uh, fun uh, before we start with the first uh, talk. So first of all, Cecilia, thanks for the comment about the mug. Actually, in the last uh, in the last events, I didn't have such a nice uh, coffee mug. So um, Kevin, our uh, employee, my my team colleague, uh, has uh, brought me this nice ready for coffee mug. So thanks, Kevin. And uh, yeah, I have here one very nice sweet. It's a Mannerschnitten. As we are from Vienna and streaming live from Vienna, um, this is a very traditional street here. And I would like to send it to you, to one of you, but you have to answer a question and we will pick up, uh, pick a winner after the first talk. So my question is, and you can use the chat to answer it, is uh, what's the name of the Java mascot? So just write your, uh, write your answer in the chat. After the first talk, we will pick a winner and uh, you can then just send us your email address and mailing address to hello at readevelopers.com. So with that said, I would say it's time for our first talk. Um, we are going to talk with Daniel Stremetsky. Daniel Stremetsky is the head of uh, uh, digital platforms at XIO. He's an Oracle certified professional. He holds a PhD in information and uh, communication. He basically spent uh, most of his career 
developing uh, Java enterprise web applications and coaching other developers. And we are super happy to get him on stage. So let's welcome Daniel. Hello. Nice to be Hi, here. Hi, Daniel. Hi, How Sam. are you? Thanks for the, thanks for the lovely introduction. I'm, I'm really good. Thank you. Perfect. So, Daniel, I heard you are from Varazdin. So, Pozdrav. Trying Pozdrav, to Pozdrav. always greet the people in the local language. So, let's see. For this one, it was easy. Um, and uh, currently, you are in Salzburg uh, because you had some workshops with your company. So, maybe you can tell us like what, what is your day-to-day -day work looking like and also what will we take uh, out from your talk today? Sure. Perfect. So, um, yes, I'm uh, from a um, small town Varazdin in north of Croatia, just one hour away from Zagreb. But at the moment, as, as you might uh, see, I'm, I'm actually uh, in my hotel room in Salzburg because we have a series of, of internal workshops with, uh, uh, with Excel, with my company. Um, and um, my pretty much day-to-day -day work is split 50-50 with kind of leadership and organizational topics and technical topics. So I, I worked as a Java developer for eight to nine, nine years. Uh, today, I, I don't develop that much anymore. I, I work on projects in, in the solution architect role where I'm in, more, more focused on, um, on the overall architecture. Uh, yeah, and today uh, I, have a, I have a talk that uh, really goes a bit uh, low level and, and we are really in investigating some, some internal things of how JVM works. Um, and I decided to, to have a talk like this because developers mostly, you know, uh, are, are really focused on code and, and on requirements and, and the everyday work. And really rarely uh, we find time to, to, you know, deep dive into, into some really specific internal th things uh, related to Java and the JVM. And I think this conference is, is a perfect place to do so. Okay, perfect. That sounds very nice. Uh, Daniel, one last thing. So I also saw that you are a blogger. You blog about Java. So where can people find your articles? And what are you blogging about? Yes, I'm, I'm blogging mostly about uh, Java topics and some Spring topics. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm writing for, I think, one of the most uh, popular Java blogs uh, worldwide. It's, uh, I think it's pronounced uh, Beldung, but it's uh, it's actually a tough word to pronounce. Uh, I want, I, I didn't want to say it myself, so I <laughs> left it to you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, yes, yes, and even even the session, I also linked to some of the articles I wrote, so that um, people who are interested in finding some more information about some specific topics can can also refer to those links. Okay, perfect. Then Daniel, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, let's get started. I hope that you can now see my, my presentation in the full screen mode. So um, happy to be first time on, on VR developers uh, and happy to present you a topic uh, which, uh, which is uh, actually kind of a question mark, is Java a compiled or interpreted language? Um, and it, I, it would be really good if you try to think about this, this question now and uh, think about if you, you already have an opinion or, or, um, or an answer on this question. And then maybe at the at the end of the lecture you can you can reflect back um, yeah and and check if 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 your opinion was um, was correct related to what we are going to talk about uh, in the lecture in more detail um, to to really put some more uh, focus on on what we are going to deep dive uh, that is the just in time compilation concept in uh, the JVM okay so let's get started uh, so this is our agenda for today. Uh, we're going to start with um, with a um, really simple introduction where we're going to look at some history and, and the basic differences between compiled and interpreted languages. Uh, and then we will slowly start to deep dive into some Java and the JVM specifics. And the first topic we're going to deep dive into is uh, actually bytecode. So the platform neutral bytecode that gets, gets produced by the Java compiler. Um, and then we will look at, at the just-in-time compilation um, concept in, in Java. 
Uh, we're going to deep dive into this topic because some things are very specific to the JVM. For example, there are two types of, of just-in-time compilers in Java. One is called server, the other one client compiler, and how it all relates to the latest compilation concept used in Java, which is called um, tier compilation. So these are all um, some specifics we are going to deep dive into. And of course, we're going to leave some time um, at the end of the lecture for your questions. Okay, so let's get started with the introduction. So I think all of us learned that um, at school, um, the, the, how we differentiate um, programming languages based on their level of, of abstraction. This is a, a really, really basic thing, right? And we basically uh, distinguish uh, really low level machine code. So the code that can actually run on a specific machine or a specific operating system. Um, then, of course, somewhere in the middle, we have the assembler code, but we work nowadays in, in um, high level programming languages like Java, like JavaScript, like, like C++. Um, and these languages are either compiled or interpreted, right? So we need to get this high level programming languages code. We need to get them uh, converted in some way into machine code. So we can do this via compilation or via interpretation. Um, if we look at compiled languages, um, what, what, does, what, what does this actually mean? We're basically, we convert directly the high-level language into machine-native code uh, using a, a, a specific program that's called, called a compiler. And uh, of course, when we do this, this means that we need to compile our code all the time. So basically, we need to rebuild our, our program um, when we make a code change to, to do this conversion. Um, with Interpreted languages, it's it's a bit different because the interpreters, uh, unlike compilers, actually operate on the high-level source code and they execute the program piece by piece uh, uh, during runtime while execution. And this basically enables interpreted languages to to run on all on multiple platforms. So you don't need to compile it for a specific uh, platform or specific type of of CPU architecture. Um, and now let's let's consider how uh, Java and JVM was actually designed. Well, uh, one of the first design goals of Java was actually portability. Um, everyone who who works with Java, I think, knows that Java is uh, and JVM was built in a way uh, that the code that you write once in in Java, your Java code can basically run on on uh, any modern platform. So you can run it on your phone, on Android. Uh, you, you can run it on your um, on your uh, Mac. You can run it on your on your Windows PC. So of course, uh, this is immediately you know kind of a sign or a clue that Java must be interpreted because basically only only interpreted languages can can work in in such a way. And yeah, that's that that is actually true. But then you might wonder, okay, but uh, why do I need to compile it? Uh, so you, usually when you start working with Java, you learn that you need to compile it with Java C, where actually you, you don't need to anymore. It's, it's, uh, it's been done uh, automatically in the latest version. But if you learned Java in some, some older versions like I did, then you first needed to compile it, uh, and then you were, you, you were able to, to run it. Um, so does that mean that it's um, compiled or interpreted language? So it it's really could be confusing. Um, the key thing is here, that the compilation that happens with uh, Java C is not the compilation to machine code for um, for execution. So the Java source code is first actually compiled into what we call bytecode. And bytecode bytecode is um, different from machine code. It's uh, it's a special language that's actually native to the JVM. So it's it's used by the JVM. Uh, what JVM then does with the with the bytecode is that it uh, interprets and executes this code uh, on runtime. So bytecode is basically the code that the, the JVM uh, understands, and this is why we need to to have JVM installed on our machine to be able to to run uh, Java applications. Okay, so uh, this is a really you know high level uh, story now, and if we if we really want to take a look at how things work. Uh, inside JVM, what we need to do is we really need to deep dive into the, the architecture of the JVM. And on, on this picture, you can see the five basic 
building blocks of, of the JVM again on a really high level. Um, the, the first, the first uh, component uh, is actually the class loader. The class loader is in charge of bringing the compiled class files. So this is, this is the files that contain uh, the compiled bytecode into the JVM uh, memory area. Uh, and then the component that is really in charge of uh, reading this bytecode and converting it into machine native code that we can actually execute on a specific machine is called the execution engine. Um, and the execution engine, again, has three key components. Um, and the first one is an interpreter, and the second one is JIT compiler. And there is also a garbage, garbage collector, which is a, a separate topic that we are not going to uh, go into today. So what you can see from this, from this picture of JVM's architecture is that Java actually uses a combination of an interpreter and a compiler. But it's a specific type of compiler. So it's called JIT compiler or just-in-time compiler. So um, let's, let's take a look why Java uses just-in-time compilers, why, why interpretation is, 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 is not enough, why we need both. Um, so and you, you might wonder, so if, if, uh, if Java would use an interpreter, so how can it be so fast? Because we know that today uh, uh, Java is one of the best performing languages. Uh, and if it was interpreted, of course, then uh, it would be significantly slower for, from example, C++. But there is actually just-in-time compilers that, uh, that help with this uh, performance issue. So um, in, historically, interpreted languages were always considered uh, much slower than compiled languages. And uh, what just-in-time compilers uh, do, they actually, um, they actually are a, a major game changer because they turn uh, the code from the interpreted language into machine native language in runtime. So as the program runs, actually compilation is happening. So that's why it's called just-in-time compilation. Um, and now you might wonder, okay, but how, how does Java know which, which parts of code to, to compile and when? Um, and basically, there is a, a concept of profiling. So what JVM does is uh, it will use JIT compiler not for, for every piece of code, but based on how frequently this code is used. Uh, and JVM decides which code to compile based on the profiling information that it is collecting during, during runtime. So basically, it only compiles frequently executed code. Um, yes, and uh, these frequently executed sections um, of code are referred to in, in Java as hotspots. And uh, this is such a, such a big term in, in Java that actually uh, the, the most popular implementation of the JVM is actually called Hotspot JVM. So um, there are multiple implementations of the JVM, but most of us use the one uh, maintained by Oracle, and, and that is the Hotspot JVM. Um, and you might wonder, OK, uh, there is this uh, just-in-time compiler that improves Java performance, but is there a way that I can actually actually uh, play around with this and, and measure performances? And of course, like everything in, in programming, it, it can, of course, be done. You can simply measure um, how much time it takes to, to run a specific method. So you take the number of nanoseconds when the method starts, when it, when it ends, and just, just sum up the results. It's, it's actually pretty simple. Um, and we can actually uh, disable uh, just-in-time compilation in Java using a sim simple flag, like you see here on the slide. So java.compiler equals none. Uh, and we can run um, a simple method like this Fibonacci method that you see on, on the left side. So this is a, a really simple method calculating the Fibonacci number from a specific index. Um, and uh, I didn't. I won't go into too much details. But if you wanna, if you wanna uh, find out some more about uh, about this specific simple performance test, you can you can refer to the um, article uh, linked below. But let's say you run the same method a uh, hundred times. Okay, so you just create a for loop in your main method, and, and you call this Fibonacci method a um, hundred times and measure that results. Uh, this is exactly what I did, and I shared the results on the right side. Um, and you can see that if we turn off JIT compiler, 
Uh, after 100 runs of this method, we get more than 500% um, a percent slower performance compared to JIT compilation enabled. And the performances are even comparable or even in this specific case, a bit better than C++, even with all the optimization flags um, um, checked in during the C++ uh, compilation. In this specific case, Java was um, 30, 33% uh, percent, um, faster. This does not mean that Java is always faster than C++. Um, in, in some other examples, maybe maybe C++ would be a bit, uh, a bit faster, but it's, it, performances are really comparable. If you compare those performances with um, a language that is fully interpreted like JavaScript, um, you will actually get more than 700% uh, slower performance on this specific example. Okay, so basically we have JIT compilers in the JVM in place that uh, are a major, major performance boost for, um, for Java applications. Uh, what's really specific for Java because other, or other languages also, also support just in time compilation concept is that Java actually supports two types of JIT compilers. Um, one is called C1 or the client compiler. And the second one is called C2 or the server compiler. So let's let's explain what the difference is. So uh, the C1 is a type of a JIT compiler that is built um, for faster startup time. So uh, it's a compiler that will try to co uh, compile the code as soon as possible. And basically, it is historically used for applications that are short-lived, or and basically applications when where where, where when you are building the application, you know that. Uh, Startup time is, is a really important non-functional requirement for you. Uh, on the contrary, C2 or server compiler is optimized for the long-term better overall performance. So what it will do, it will analyze the, the code over a longer period of time compared to C1, uh, and it will try to make better optimizations, basically to produce better, better um, optimized compiled code. And again, um, th this the most common use case is is for server side applications that are that are um, running for for a long time. Um, in earlier versions of Java, we actually had to manually choose uh, between the, these two types of of JIT compilers. So so again, there were some flags uh, that you need to set to 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 pick which one of these two. Um, uh, you want to use. Of course, both of them have some pros and, and some cons. So the C2 compiler will take uh, more time. It will consume more memory um, to, to pretty much compile the same method. But when it does compile it, it generates better optimized uh, native code. So it, it uh, produces, uh, it gives us better performance. Uh, so that was the case before Java 7. In Java 7, there was a major change because the concept of tiered compilation was um, introduced. And the goal of um, tiered compilation is actually to try to use the best of both worlds. And these worlds are, of course, C1 uh, and C2 compiler. So what tiered compilation um, try to do is, is actually to use a mix of both compilers um, and trying to achieve both fast startup and good long-term performance because why would we why would we settle just for for one of these? We of course would like to have both. Uh, so what um, JVM does with the tiered compilation concept is that it compiles frequently executed sections first with C1 because we wanna we wanna reach better performances as soon as possible, but later it also kicks in the C2 compiler. So when we collect more profiling information, uh, the C2 kicks in. And, uh, and basically uh, produces a better optimized native code and replaces the one uh, generated by, by C1. Um, what does that mean for performance? This actually had a really big impact on, on, on performance. So um, if, if you take a look at, at, the, at this diagram, so when, when you start up a job application, um, your code will always first be interpreted. And this means, of course, in the start, in the in this start time, um, you will always have uh, worse performance uh, until this warm-up phase is finished. So after 
after a method is called um, a couple of times, uh, th there is a threshold that you can actually define, uh, then the C1 compiler will, will kick in, right? And it will compile the, the, the code and you will reach better performances. Uh, so during both of these stages, interpretation and C1 compilation, um, what the JVM is continuing to collect profiling information. Uh, and then at, at a certain threshold, the C2 compiler will also kick in. And again, um, this will result in a, in a performance boost. But at this point, when your code is C2 compiled, there is uh, no more reason to collect profiling information because we, we now produced uh, machine code that is most optimized that you can get from the JVM. And then, then there is, uh, there is, uh, uh, isn't much sense to, to, to collect uh, more profiling information because we cannot do any further optimization. Um, one additional benefit of tiered compilation compared to how it used to work in older versions is we actually get more profiling information because before the tiered compilation concept, the profiling information was only collected during interpretation. So now we have this, this longer period where um, JVM is actually collecting uh, profiling information. Uh, let's talk about compilation levels now in, in the tiered compilation concept. So um, it's a bit weird that there are actually five compilation levels in the JVM. Why is this weird? Because you have you have uh, two JIT compilers, right? And you have one interpreter. So we would expect probably three compilation levels. Uh, but actually the trick is that um, C1 um, can can use uh, kind of three different ways of working. And this is why we, we actually ended up with five compilation levels in the JVM. Um, the level zero is, is the initial phase interpretation where we, of course, we, we are getting performances that are that are not as good as as uh, uh, compared to to a compiled uh, code. Um, level one is referred to as simple C1 compiled code. Um, this basically means the code is compiled with C1, but there is no profiling information being collected. And now you might wonder, okay, why would we use this, or why would JVM use this? And it actually has only one use case, and that is for methods that the JVM concludes that are uh, trivial. And these trivial methods, whether they get compiled with C1 or C2, would, would end up with, a, with the same um, uh, native code. So actually, if we compile these trivial methods with um, C1, uh, that's, that's good enough. It's the same as, as we would compile it with C2. The next level is referred to as limited C1 compiled code, which means C1 will only um, uh, use light profiling. And this is basically only used when uh, C2Q is full and we want to make use of C1 until uh, C2 is, is free. This is basically, again, ju just an exception. So the actual normal path would be to go from level zero directly to level three and to have full C1 compiled code. So this means we compile C1 and we use full pro profiling. So this is the default, default compilation path. Uh, of course, the next step uh, would be to to compile the code uh, with, with C2 and then collecting uh, no more profiling information. Um, th there is also a concept of caching, of course, because when we when we compile uh, the code and produce uh, machine native code, we, we, we want to save it somewhere so it can be reused. Um, and and the code, uh, the, the C2 code is, is cached for a long time, but it can happen that it gets um, de-optimized. So, so what's de-optimization? It's, it's basically a concept. Uh, so when the compiler does uh, the compilation, it makes certain assumptions. And when those assumptions are proven wrong, then we need to de-optimize and recompile the code. Uh, and you can see an example on, on this slide. So if, if we take a look at the left side and the hot path uh, flowchart, you will see that th there is a certain condition and, and under this condition methods are called in this order one, two, three, five. And th this is actually gonna be, gonna be compiled like that for faster execution, but there's gonna be a guard in place, okay? So, and when JVM uh, figures out that the profile information doesn't match, uh, the, the compiled method behavior anymore, then what JVM will do, it will de-optimize the compiled code. This pretty much means um, take it out of the, out of the uh, 
cash, um, throw it and um, start the, the process uh, all over again, start interpretation, start profiling and, and then compiling with C1 and C2. So that was tiered compilation concept. Um, and let's take a look in at some properties that we and, and flags that we can set in Java to disable or, or tweak um, tiered compilation. Like pretty much everything with Java, it's, it's, it's possible to, to use some parameters. For example, if we use the minus tiered compilation flag, we can completely disable the tiered compilation concept and go back to, um, to how it was before. Uh, or we could actually completely disable both JIT compilers and just run everything with an interpreter using the minus int flag. Um, however, these are all things that you probably never want to do, right? Be unless you have a really, really good reason to do so. Um, tiered compilation is, is, I think, a really cool concept that that uh, boosts performance. So, so if 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 uh, not necessarily, um, I, I advise definitely to stick to the default. It's working really nice. Um, what you can play around with um, is actually setting thresholds for different levels. So what's a threshold? The threshold is um, the number of um, method invoca invocations that needs to happen be before your code will be compiled. So first your method will be interpreted until it's called, um, it's, called uh, it's executed a hundred times or a thousand times. And then uh, a specific compiler will kick in C1 or C2. Uh, we can actually set those thresholds for different compilation levels. So you can set a threshold for uh, compilation level two, three, and four. And in here on the slide uh, in the bottom, you can see you can see one of these examples if if you want to uh, play around uh, with these parameters due to uh, performance reasons. That is that is an option. Okay, so. To summarize everything we, we talked about, I, I created this, uh, this small diagram that is explaining how uh, a method is going through the compilation and execution lifecycle. So your, your Java method is, or actually the, the generated bytecode is first gonna be interpreted by the JVM's interpreter. And during the interpretation, there's gonna be profiling information collected. Um, so the next step is actually uh, to generate uh, machine code. And for that reason, JVM uses C1 because it tries to generate the machine native code to reach better performances really quickly. And it uses C1 to, to compile the method. Uh, during, during this um, stage, profiling information is still being collected. And the C1 compiled code is saved in the code cache. Okay, so, and after that, once the next threshold is reached, the C2 will kick in. The C2 will use this additional profiling information to, to generate uh, a more optimized code, better performant code, and then it will save the compiled code into the code cache. At this point, the C2 compiled code will replace the previously C1 compiled code. So the C1 compiled code will, will go out of the code cache. And this C2 compiled code is going to be long lived in the code cache unless an, a de optimization happens, right? So, uh, and we talked about uh, de optimization. If, if that happens, then pretty much we start the process all over again and, and we again go into the same circle starting from interpretation. So basically, I've, I've just um, explained everything that you can see on, on the left side. It's a, it's a summary, again, of the method compilation. Um, you could, um, you know, trust me on this, that this is how it works. Or if you're interested, you could actually um, observe all this in the uh, Java's compilation logs. Um, if you set the flag plus print compilation, you will uh, get an output of the compilation logs. Uh, and these compilation logs contain um, a timestamp. So a timestamp when a specific method has been compiled. You will see its compilation level, so from zero to four. You will, of course, get your, your method name that's gonna match your method name in Java. And you will also see some flags that are indicating that a de-optimization has happened. And if you, if you try this out on a really simple example, um, 
it's it's really easy, you know, to observe in in this log um, the whole method lifecycle that I've just explained. Um, again, I'm not going to go into the compilation logs in detail, but if you are interested in a topic, you can actually um, look up an example uh, that is linked in, in one of the articles um, on this slide below. Okay, so to sum up what we discussed in the lecture is, uh, we started with a question, is Java compiled or interpreted language? And if you answered compiled, that's true. If you answered interpreted, that's also true because Java is actually both. It's 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 uh, the it's JVM uses a combination of an interpreter and a JIT compiler, so it basically does both. Uh, and of course, the goal is is to to use the best of both, um, because interpreted languages enable platform neutral execution, while compiled languages enable high performance. And Java Java simply wants to be wants to be both of those. Um, to in order to to get that kind of setup in the JVM, so it's it's not a standard compilation process. Instead, we talked about just-in-time compilation. We talked about that initially JVM uses an interpreter. It collects profiling information, but that finally it uses the JIT compiler, actually two JIT compilers to compile the what is called hot methods bytecode to, to machine uh, native code. And when we looked at performance, of course, in the, in the warm-up phase, Java doesn't have such great performances, but uh, after certain... Uh, certain time um, of the application is running, Java's performance is actually uh, very much comparable to any fully uh, compiled language performances. So that's everything for for today. Um, yeah, I hope you, you liked the lecture. I hope you um, learned something new or, or found something, something interesting. Um, yeah, if you want to connect with me, I would be more than happy. Uh, so you can um, drop me an email with some additional questions or add me on LinkedIn, send me a message. Um, happy to happy to talk about um, any, any of these topics that I really feel passionate about. So Java, software craftsmanship, um, architecture, developer coaching, training, um, etc. So that's everything from me today and of course we will reserve um, some time at the end uh, for your questions okay daniel thank you very much for the presentation there are quite some questions in the chat and in the q a tool uh but first for the ones who are asking if the presentation is going to be recorded and available afterwards yes you can uh, look it up after the event on realdevelopers.com um, just give us a day or two to publish it so everything is recorded and you can watch it later if you jumped in too late today. So, Daniel, uh, Theo has a question. He's asking how much memory and uh, processing power is C1 and 2 using? How much memory and processing power is C1 using? Uh, I don't know the concrete answer. So to be able to provide a really concrete answer, uh, we would actually need to do some performance tests, which I, I didn't do for this specific use case, but it's using uh, less than C2. That's, that, is, uh, that is a fact. That is something you can also find in the, in the Oracle documentation. But to actually you know, provide a, a concrete answer, uh, I mean, we would need to design a performance test and, and check this out, which could actually be, yeah, an interesting topic for, for some of the future articles. For the next time. Okay. Um, Peter is asking, if the Java code is compiled to bytecode, why not compile all code uh, to fast machine code instead of the bytecode generation step? Yeah. Uh, because if if we would compile to directly to machine native code, then that, that's, for example, pretty much what C++ does, right? Then we, we can execute this code only on a specific machine. Uh, and then we, we lose the, the power of Java's portability. Because uh, when, you, when you develop a Java application, um, you can compile it to bytecode and you can run it on every, every machine that supports Java. And this is like, most popular um, operating systems worldwide, you can use Java anywhere. If we would compile directly to machine native code, we would get better performances, but then we, 
would only be able to run the code on this on this specific operating uh, operating system and this uh, specific uh, CPU. Okay, thank you. So there is some more questions coming in, but we have enough time, so no worries. Uh, Ivan is asking if we start to manipulate JIT, uh, what about memory heap, etc. Any advice? Um, actually, um, Java or JVM is is gonna is gonna take care of it. So it's an internal um, JVM thing. The whole tiered compilation process is, I I think, something that you don't really need to worry about as a Java developer. But I think is a really interesting concept that is is good to to know and understand. So so uh, Java has a reserved spot in in the JVM memory. Uh, for this code cache that we talked about. Um, and you can actually tweak it. There, there are some flags uh, where uh, you could um, increase this, this uh, memory space. Um, I, I know there are some articles uh, dedicated to the code cache on, on Beldung, so I, I didn't author them myself, uh, but you can refer to those um, and, and check out those flags, how to actually uh, assign more, more memory to the code cache. Okay, thank you. Dan Vishal is asking, if you increase the threshold uh, value, does the application work faster then? If you increase the threshold, the application actually works a bit slower because uh, what, what it, uh, it will run faster if we compile it faster, right? And if we set a bigger threshold, then that means uh, we tell the JVM you need to wait for a longer number of executions until you compile a method with C1 or C2, depending on which threshold you set. So actually, if you increase this value, uh, you will end up with a bit worse performance during this uh, initial phase. After you reach the threshold, after it's compiled, you, you're going to end up long term, you're going to end up with the same performances. But basically what we are tweaking with, with these flags is this initial warm-up phase and how, how long does it take. Okay, then another question uh, about the profiling. So can you go a bit deeper in how it is done with G by G GVM? Um, so I didn't really look that topic up that much uh, in detail. So how exactly this works, uh, but it's basically uh, inspecting um, the number of invocations for methods. So in, in the most simplistic way. So, um, and uh, th th that is the information that, that the JVM needs to, in order to decide uh, what is a hotspot, what is hot code, what, what it makes sense to compile and what's fine to, to keep interpreting because it's, it's not being used that much. Um, unfortunately, I'm not that familiar with, you know, specific details on what kind of profiling information is, is extracted, um, how, how this is, uh, you know, saved in which format. Those are some details I, I haven't uh, looked up in, in detail. Okay, let's take two more questions, if that's okay with you. Sure. Okay, then Martin is asking, um, do you have measured uh, Java against Golang at compile time? Uh, Golang, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, actually, if I did that in the article. It was some time since I wrote it. Uh, but I did measure some other languages besides C++. I think actually Go was one of them. So if you refer to the article that I linked, um, you will get more details about the Fibonacci performance test I did. And I compared it with C++, but also with some other languages. And um, for this specific example, actually Java was the fastest. But again, we cannot draw, uh, you know, conclusions about overall performance of Java based on this simple example. There will be some other examples where, for example, C++ is faster or Go is faster. Uh, but overall, the performance of these languages is, is very much comparable. Okay. And the last question for this session, um, personal one from Git Profit. Uh, what do you think about Kotlin? Is it just Java without boilerplate? 
Um, I never actually worked with Kotlin, so I, I saw, I, I mean, I read about it, I saw a few, few sessions about it. Um, I think it's really cool. So yeah, it's removing a lot of, lot of boilerplate uh, from, from Java and it's basically uh, running in, in, in the JVM. So it, it also gets compiled to bytecode. And then when we talk about um, everything that we talked about in this uh, session about uh, execution, it, it again uses the JVM and, and it uses the, the same concepts. So I think uh, it's it's mostly about, I would say, personal preference. I I oh. definitely really like some, some concepts of, of Kotlin, uh, but yeah, I, I worked with Java for uh, for a long time and uh, yeah, it's it's I guess it would take some time to, to switch to, to Kotlin or or any other JVM language, but the same concepts apply there as well. Okay, Daniel, thank you so much. Um, it was really an interesting session and thanks also to the audience for the questions. If you want to reach out to Daniel, then just check out on the event page. There is his social media links or LinkedIn profile and so on. So you can reach out to him or you just, uh, you know, um, go back in the presentation and there was this slide with the contact data for any more question. Um, yeah, Daniel, I hope you have enjoyed it as well. I have. Uh, thank you for a lot of questions. Um, sorry, I wasn't able to answer all of them. Uh, but yeah, it was it was a yeah great experience for me. I'm happy happy to to do this talk first time, and I'm looking forward to some future talks. Perfect. So see you again in the future, and have a nice uh, trip back to Varazdin. So bye bye, Daniel. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. So before we go into a short break before the next talk, let's uh, raffle out this uh, Mana Schnippen. Um, Messi backstage has picked two winners actually. So one winner is Alexandra. So Alexandra, if you are still here, just drop us a line uh, to hello at rearddevelopers.com with your address and uh, we are going to pack this write a nice message and uh, send it to you. And the second winner is uh, Martin Zhekov. So here, same, please just drop us a line to, to uh, hello.com and we are going to send the Manaschnitten to you. Um, with that said, uh, we have a short break, uh, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, and then we are going to talk about how to escape developer nightmares. I think that's something that is super interesting for all of us. So see you in 10 minutes again. Have you found your dream job as a developer? Or are you stuck in an unfulfilling job? On wearedevelopers.com, you find over a thousand jobs in Europe that fit the tech stack that you want to work with and salaries go up to 130K. All you have to do is create a free profile and you automatically get matched with jobs that fit your requirements. So what are you waiting for? Create your free profile and let companies apply to you now.
Have you found your dream job as a developer? Or are you stuck in an unfulfilling job? On wearedevelopers.com, you find over a thousand jobs in Europe that fit the tech stack that you want to work with, and salaries go up to 130K. All you have to do is create a free profile, and you automatically get matched with jobs that fit your requirements. So what are you waiting for? Create your free profile and let companies apply to you now.
Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope you had enough time to grab another cup of coffee. We are going into our next session and it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker. It's uh, Rustam, he is the chief engineer of computers. He's a computer scientist, he's a Google developer, expert and last but not least, he is a Java champion. So let's not uh, waste our time and let's get him right on stage. Hello, great to be hey. here. Good dag, I learned. Good dag. <laughs> you are joining us from Norway. That's correct. I'm in Oslo, Norway. Uh, okay. So, yeah. How is the weather there? It's uh, actually it's uh, pretty nice. I mean, they're 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 saying it's going to get a bit more autumny in a few days, but for now it's um, sunny and warm and really like enjoying the last days of the summer, I guess. <laughs> okay, that sounds nice. So, Rustam, we are really looking forward to your presentation because the title is Escaping Developer Nightmares. So, maybe you could uh, give us up front a couple of um, yeah, sneak previews, sneak peeks. Sure. Um, I, I This is a kind of a, a fun talk that I put together based on my experiences doing different kind of things. So then I'll talk a bit more about that in, in a second. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a mix of tips and tricks to make your life easier as a developer. And it's also, um, it probably can help people on different stages of their career as well. So like for the beginners, for people looking for a better new cool project, for better people looking for a better uh, cool new positions or jobs or st stuff like that. So it can be actually very different uh, perspectives to this talk. I, 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 I hope it will uh, it will be useful for people in different uh, different stages of their career. Okay, perfect. And so, just dear audience, dear developers, just just like in the first session, use the Q and A tool and the chat to engage with us. So, yeah, looking forward to the talk, Rustam. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. So, um, I call this talk "Escaping Developer Nightmares," but it can be probably called very many different things. I mean, it is. Um, Probably a good idea to start with a kind of short definition, what you might define as a nightmare. I mean, what do you actually think of as a nightmare? So I, I, I kind of think that this, um, this tweet that I found some time ago, uh, it's a pretty old tweet, but it's very, 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 very relevant tweet. I, I, I think I kind of like to think so. Uh, and it's um, this is kind of thing that we uh, as developers have been at least once uh, within our span of career. And if you're a new uh, new or early stage kind of developer getting into the development uh, uh, as, as a career, maybe you will experience that at some point in the future. But I guess, uh, I guess we will experience it at some point in our uh, careers uh, at, at some point. And, um, you know, this is kind of a thing that you're asked to work on a system that's been around for some years. I mean, you can call it legacy code base. You can call it a system that's been alive for a few years. I mean, five years, 10 years, and then you know some parts of it will be considered legacy one way or another. And then you try to run tests and you can't find tests or tests are gone or tests are old or tests are not running or something like that. Then try to read specs. Well, there is no specs. It can be any other way of doing that? I mean, there might be specs might be outdated. Specs might be uh, original specs that were kind of uh, valid five years ago, but not anymore. And then you try to write a fix and well, you know, and, and, and bugs happen. And, and this is kind of one way of defining that. The other perspective, like I, I said just a second ago, it might be a bit different perspective when you are working on a project and you're trying to convince your customer or uh, your product manager or whoever is kind of responsible for 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 asking you what to do or giving you uh, kind of go go and no go to 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 some parts of uh, your job is that to convince that person that uh, time spent on doing things that are not directly relevant to new cool features to new things and everything that is actually a good idea so that can be also another way of looking at uh, those nightmares because if you don't do that and if you just focus only on visible things you will end up in some kind of 
uh, nightmare uh, scenario anyway. So a uh, few words about myself. My name is Rustam. I live and work here in Norway at a company called Compitas, and I am a Google developer expert. I am also a Java champion. I've been working with mostly uh, Java-related systems, and I've been working all, on kind of all levels of that as a developer, as an architect, as a delivery manager, as a tech lead, and uh, also on, on, on kind of consultancy side where you kind of hired to do reviews of systems that others have, have, have created. And this is basically my kind of a collection of tips and tricks that I've collected throughout the years and things that I sometimes do when I'm asked to review projects. So uh, what I am talking about, what the systems I'll be typically working with is quite large systems. It's most of the time for, for me, that would be Java systems. It can be a bit more older monolithic systems. It can be, uh, lately it's been more, uh, uh, or mostly Java, uh, Java cloud kind of related system. But I mean, the idea is the same and systems are usually quite big. So, I mean, the systems that I've been traditionally working with, with is at least 350,000 lines of code. It's been 400, 500, you know, it's, it's, it's large, large systems that take some time to build, to compile, to develop. I mean, they've been developed for many, many years. So hence this part of, um, um, you know, um, uh, parts of it being possibly legacy and stuff like that, right? So what I did was to kind of try to put together all those tips and tricks and things that I do when I'm asked to, to review the systems. And I think that you can use those tricks to, uh, to make your project better, uh, to convince your project managers or whoever is uh, paying for uh, stuff you do uh, or kind of get, doing go, no go to what you do. Uh, to convince them to do things to make your life bit better, or when you're looking for a new project, a new position, or whatever, so things you can actually ask or dig into and, and see how projects are to see if you're going to end up there in, in, in a good project or not. Um, so the thing is that, um, um, like, you know, we have... Uh, the opposite of the uh, of the nightmare is the kind of paradise, right? It's when everything is working and everything is fantastic and so great and you know and all of that. So I tried to group all those tips and tricks into three different categories. So uh, in into this part that has to do with code. So this is probably the time where we the place where we spend most of our time. Uh, we uh, I I also have a section with tools where you kind of. Uh, put all those things that make your life working with code easier. And then you have a part that is, um, that I kind of call documentation, but it's it's more mostly about collaboration tools and stuff like that. So we'll look into that in a second. To do that, I, I, I kind of created two of my own helpers. So kind of behold my fantastic art skills and well, probably not so fantastic, probably it's the most more correct thing to say. So, I mean, we have a tiny little zombie that will help us to kind of describe the not so good things about software. And we have obviously a unicorn. I mean, you always have to have unicorns and rainbows, right? When you're talking about uh, nice things uh, in, in, in developer uh, world. So yeah, those are my, um, I, I mean, yeah, well, I probably a good thing that I don't work as a as a, as an art uh, artist or something like that. I mean, th that's not the thing I do. Um, so before that, I I also want to talk. If spend a little bit of time giving you a bit of a concept uh, context because um, this thing call we call for nightmares or the things we don't really like with the develop development environment or things we do as a developers is kind of relative because if we go back and rewind the clock, uh, what is it now? 30 years back, uh, ish, 30, 20, 30 years back. Um, and look at the time uh, and the life of the developers back then. So many of those things actually can be quite scary and hellish looking right now. But back then it was, you know, the way we did things. So, you know, 90s, the time of very, very beautiful waterfalls. That was the first things we everybody did. We did develop in waterfalls. There was no Agile, there was no uh, Scrum or Kanban or you know all those things. And we were just doing things in waterfalls and everything. everybody thought it was a very, very fantastic thing, right? Um, 
We also did uh, Java or any other programming language really in, 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 in editors like Notepad and Emacs and Vim and things like that. And I'm really not trying to start a war between the editors and IDs and everything. But the point is that there was no proper IDs with uh, like auto completion or compilation and things like that. You just had to write your stuff there. And right now it sounds like, well, you know, that's probably about time for the zombie to arrive uh, on the screen. Um, Another thing we did was like another thing. So I basically collected some things from my own experience, but I started working a little bit later. So I started working like professionally uh, in early 2000s. So 90s was still kind of when I was I was not uh, doing things professionally yet. But I asked around, I asked colleagues and everything, and I was asking them like, um, but some of those things, like for example, the thing I'm going to mention now uh, is something that actually kind of got into the uh, early 2000s and I had to work with as well. And probably you've seen that as well. Uh, like one of them was Visual Source Safe. That was one of the first things I had to work of the enterprise source uh, kind of versioning systems. And this is not the Source Safe you know right now. It's a totally different beast. Uh, and uh, you, I mean, if you haven't worked with that, try asking people how what they think about that, and you know I'll, I won't spend much time about that. But you know, uh, we also did things like CVS. So CVS actually was a brand new thing that came out in 1990. SourceSafe came out in 1994. So back then, it was actually really new and bleeding edge things. Right now, when we think back at it, it's like you know it's unthinkable to work with things like that, right? Um, Compilation and building things. We actually were building class paths uh, in 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 bad files. We would put them all in bad files or whatever operating systems you would be building on. Uh, in this case, that would be Windows, uh, but could be Linux or anything. But still, you would be putting together class paths into one big long, long string in one way or another with shell scripts, bad files, whatever, and you would kind of use. A, a compiler from command line to compile them. And right now, it's kind of still. In also an unthinkable thing, right? Because now we have Maven and many would probably think of, oh, well, Maven is kind of old thing. It's been around there for quite some time. But actually, you know, in 2004, that was a brand new thing. So before 2004, we kind of um, had to use something else. And now a lot of people think of Ant that was used before that as a super old thing. But again, Ant was released in 2000. That was the first release of that. So, you know, 90s was still with no ant even. Um, so, you know, still kind of a bit hellish thing. And this one is actually a fun thing. I asked a colleague of mine, I was like, give me something really, really bad that happened to you. And uh, so he was like, yeah, you know what? We, I, have, I think I have one thing. And um, so uh, we were doing issue tracking, so putting bugs into somewhere. And now we're used to have some kind of systems that would collect those. But back then, there was nothing. So we were putting that in MS Excel uh, files and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, I mean, that sucks. But what, what's the problem? Why it's so bad? I mean, why it's so much worse than all the other things that you might have mentioned and things like that? And he was like, wait, wait, wait. I'm not done talking. Um, so it was MS Access files. but. Um, the database file was actually in a shared network folder uh, on somewhere on the network uh, where many people would have access to it and would possibly be possible. It would be possible for them to open it and edit it. And that thing is not made for multiple edits, right? So it's it's actually kind of one system local database kind of thing. So what can possibly go wrong there, right? Um, all of those things are gone now. Now we have systems for all those nice things, and we have all um, really, really cool systems. And you would think that now it's all just unicorns and rainbows, and this talk should shouldn't be even necessarily. Uh, but you know, things change, and it, like I said, everything is relative. So uh, we have removed some of the impediments, but we have created some new ones, or we kind of see, meet along the way in new ones. So let's talk a bit more, more about that. Um, like I said, three parts, and I would like to start with the code uh, part. And lots of those things and tips and tricks I'm going to be mentioning here will be um, can be or will be applicable or can be applicable uh, in in one way or another. And you don't have to do all of them at the same time. You can do one little tiny change at a time, and it will still 
make your life a little bit better. And lots of those things, lots of the things that I will mention, somehow, one way or another, you might have heard in, 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 in one or another context. And one of the contexts would be continuous anything, right? Integration, development, delivery, all those things are being, oh, some of those things are being mentioned uh, in, in, in this context. Another context uh, is also, which is uh, very popular nowadays, where we talk about a lot of cloud native applications. Doesn't mean that those applications have to run on the cloud, but they can run on the cloud, right? So, uh, Again, some of the context to, uh, concepts, sorry, you will be seeing in, in, in that context as well. And um, usually it's being sold to you as this kind of big rocket ship that will take you to uh, another planet or you know to space and back and everything's going to be fantastic. But like I said, you can do one tiny little thing at a time and still improve your project gradually without doing this big, huge launch of a monster super starship thing um and um yeah like i said uh those things if you do them right it kind of becomes from the uh, nightmare to this paradise so um you know i i, I live in the northern part of norway it's kind of, uh, in the northern part of europe sorry uh south south kind of southish part of norway but you know um uh, so Probably the paradise kind of thing is mostly associated with, you know, sandy beaches and sunny and palm trees and everything. So that's hence the drawing that you see there. Uh, but, you know, your mileage may vary. Any kind of paradise or ha happy place you want to be as a developer works, I guess, here as well. Um, let's start with the code part, with the developer uh, kind of closest to a development uh, perspective, right? What I usually do, I ask uh, when I when I ask when I ask to review a project or when I'm getting into a new project or you know things like that and try to get familiarized with the project, I usually try to look at the code quality first because that kind of makes it sure that code is readable and you know is 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 easy to understand and easy to pro process as a human being, not as a compiler. And 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 I usually ask things like, um, do you have a code standard? And uh, usually a lot of places would say, yeah, yeah, sure, we do. I mean, of course we do, yeah, yeah, of course. No, 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 that's what kind of question is that? But then I ask a next question, a follow-up question saying like, do you actually follow your code standards? And that's where people usually get a little bit more kind of, um, uh, yeah, I think we do, maybe, you know, and, 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 and so, so it starts. Uh, another thing which is kind of, uh, absolutely much less uh, important as, for example, code standards or the other things I will be mentioning, but it still gives me some kind of a pointer to a direction where to dig and how the kind of the health of the project and the code, code quality in general is going, uh, is to look into uh, different encodings that file ha files have. Because like, think you have, if you think that you have, say, I don't know, 500,000 lines of code, that would be a lot of Java files. There will be a lot of um, different classes and packages and everything. So go through all of them, look at the encodings. And if you see extreme amount of different encoders that will probably, it doesn't have to be a bad thing, but it will probably be a pointer into that they might not have some kind of standardized way of developing things that it might kind of things that might slip through. And, you know, um, while it most of the times doesn't break things, but if you have a special characters, like for example, this is it. A, 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 a absolutely normal Norwegian word, and that one is another one, and that's the third one. And all of them have this extra characters that technically or theoretically can break your system, and that have happened. Or, I mean, it can be, I don't know, say, totally randomly chosen language. It can be Spanish and the, the, the extra characters there. So all those characters with the wrong encoding might uh, break your th systems, and it did happen. Uh, it does happen from time to time as well, right? Um, Another thing that is even less um, critical for braiding your pro pro projects, but still as a pointer to um, not lack of kind of standards and, and standardized way of developing things in a project, in a team, is a MIME standard, which is, or MIME types uh, for the files, which is totally, I mean, that will not break a single thing, but it will still give me an idea that probably some of people are using an ID and some other people are using, I don't know, a notepad for, for editing files. And some other people are using some other things. And 
that does not have to be a bad thing, but it can theoretically lead to things because then you will not, you might not have standardized uh, set of plugins to develop things. You might not have standardized way of formatting your code and, you know, a bunch of other things that kind of can lead into um, some kind of unpleasant, un unpleasant situations as, as a developer. I don't, I'm not saying that everything has to be standardized, but, you know, um, it gives you, like I said, it gives you a pointer, not a kind of silver bullet or solution to know if it's good or bad. Um, code reviews is a good thing. And many people would kind of think that, well, that's obvious, but uh, I've been experienced with seeing some projects where you would ask people if they do code reviews and they would be like, nah, we don't. I mean, we, we understand each other really well, we worked with each other really well, we kind of finish each other's sentences and, you know, for loops and you know we don't really need to do the code reviews because we're, we're we're really cool and that's a bad thing i mean it's not about that it's not about understanding each other and everything it's actually about making sure that your logic actually holds when you say it aloud so you technically can even say it to a colleague of yours or even to a tiny little rubber duck like this right so it doesn't really matter but you just say it aloud and you explain it and already a lot of work is done there as well, right? Um, all right, uh, let's go into uh, the tool part. Um, so the tools um, is kind of obvious, uh, usual suspect here would be code versioning. Uh, and code versioning systems is, uh, is fine, but then the thing is, it's not only about versioning your code. There is much more uh, to it, really, right? Because, uh, for instance, how do you do branching? What is your branching strategy? That's actually a thing that some projects uh, still have troubles. I mean, say you're working a huge project. You have a, a production line, uh, something running in production already. So you have a, some kind of branch that has to be responsible for production. You're also working on a new version, or maybe you're even kind of working a project where you need to keep track of a few newer versions coming up. And so how do you do branching here, right? What, how do you patch things when you develop thing, a new functionality or you develop uh, something that will do a bug fix? How do you make sure that it's propagated to anything that is running in production or to new features or, you know, all those things? Uh, branching is an important thing. I'm, again, I'm not going to tell you how to do that. There are many ways of doing that. We can talk a lot about that later, but branching is something that you need to think about and consider of like doing the right uh, way. Uh, another thing is that how do you handle complexity? How do you handle, handle uh, testing on different different levels uh, of your code? And that can be uh, things like, you know, um, uh, static code analysis tools, or it can be end-to-end uh, -end tests, or it can be unit tests, or it can be any other things. But still, you know, you have some tools that help you with this kind of things. You don't have to do it all manually. And to, to get that uh, is an important part of uh, this reaching of this really nice uh, state as a developer. I, I would argue for that anyway. So this is one of the examples. So this is a, a, a a, uh, a cloud solution that will kind of look into your code and analyze it in a static code analysis and uh, and and provide you with some kind of feedback and give you some kind of uh, this is just an example can, there are many different tools that do that but the point is pick one use one and make sure that it is used by many many people uh, in or your project in general right because they will kind of provide you with possible bugs before they reach to production. They will do this kind of on the build time. You can do it uh, before you commit. You can do it nightly uh, or and, and fix it every every week. And then you can kind of get this a little bit of gamification thing where the numbers are getting green or red, depending on what happened for the last few days. And so you get this kind of incentive to actually make your code better and make it actually visible. So you know, putting things on, on big screens and in in, in, uh, in uh, open landscapes, if you work with that, if you don't, still make sure that it's kind of still visible. Um, so yeah, study code analysis tools, we'll talk a bit about that. There are many different ones and uh, some of them are local that can be run on your local machine. Some of them are cloud-based. Some of them are built into your uh, cloud provider, but doesn't matter. Pick one, use one, and do it at, uh, like, try to automate as much as possible of that analysis on different, different stages. There are a bunch of plugins that help you with this kind of things. Again, those plugins will 
vary from a development environment and all these kind of things that you might be using. But you know, try to look for those and try to pick something and try to advocate for for the team to use a similar set of plugins so you don't get this kind of different, totally different. I don't know, say code standard uh, formatting or uh, reports about what is a bug or what is a bad code uh, kind of thing. And you don't really have to use the standard standard, uh, like standard code standards, if you can say that, because there are a few that are published for a specific language, for instance, for Java. Uh, uh, but you can actually modify it. But if you modify it, make sure that the others on the team actually have the same set of rules. Because if everyone modifies a little bit of the standard set, in different places, you don't really have a standard. You just have local anarchy kind of thing, right? Um, another thing that is very, very, very important to talk about is third-party libraries. Those are kind of are not getting enough love, I, in my opinion. And uh, by that, I mean that do actually I usually do this when when before this pandemic situation we used to do the conferences with, with people uh, at at the events and I would do usually raise of hands and I would usually ask people to um, raise their hands uh, or how many people actually make sure that uh, the third parties they are using uh, are patched with the latest versions or they actually have a track uh, record of known issues and vulnerabilities of those uh, third party libraries. Um, Usually that would be some hands, but it wouldn't be like it wouldn't be any any anywhere close to even fifty percent of the room, but like big rooms, several hundred people and stuff. Um, then I ask next question: Is that how do they actually uh, keep track of licenses? Which is even that would be even less number of hands. And I'm not talking about licenses in the sense of money. I mean, some of things are commercial, some are not. That's fine. But then thing is. It can be also uh, open uh, source free licenses, but they're different and they require different things. And some of them would, for, for instance, require that you open source your, your projects that where you're kind of pulling in those licenses or products or libraries with those licenses. And some of them would be permissive and say, you know, cool, you use it, that's fine, do whatever you want with your code and things like that. So this is an important from many, many different points of view. So if you're creating a critical system that you're not uh, ready to kind of open source, then you probably need to have a look at your licenses and make sure that you don't use products that require you to do that or force you to do that. And obviously, well, the money part is also uh, like financial or commercial licenses is also an important thing here. But those usually things people think about, more, more, more likely to think about. And <clears throat> one last thing I usually ask people about is, do you actually track your libraries to be, to, do you make sure that your libraries are actually updated, maintained, compatible, and all the other things? And that would be like, probably in, in, in most of the cases I've seen like three, four, five hands out of several hundred people. And, um, you know, it is a very important thing because uh, vulnerabilities happen. Security vulnerabilities happen. There is a lot of them. There are a few blog posts. I mean, this is from 2017, but that project uh, been going on for uh, until now. I mean, for quite really long time. And they do find a lot of bugs uh, every year, every time. And um, the point here is that bugs will happen to us as developers, and they will be fixed at some point. You just need to make sure that when they're fixed, they end up in your project as well. And um, so this is uh, this is the same project that I mentioned that the article was 2017. This is an update from this year, just a few months back. And it's still, it's like it's 30,000 bugs in 500 open source projects, right? So bugs do happen and it's very important to make sure uh, to, 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 to patch them and make sure that you pull those changes. And now we're, then we're talking about third-party libraries. It's probably important to mention this other thing that we work a lot with nowadays is containerization of things. So you can actually put things into containers and make sure that the containers are not your security risk. And this is one of the examples that, um, that, 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 that talks about this, uh, possible uh, container exploits as well and stuff like that as well. And there is more and, and I mean, there is even more. And then the other things is that how do you actually uh, package your stuff? How do you deploy it? 
is it automated or if it's a manual process it's also a very very important part of this thing and also if it is uh, actually done to a different environments in same way or different way it's also an important part because you might not be very much tempted to automate i don't know dev environment but you will be probably automating product production environment or the other way around but you don't want to do that you want to do it in a similar manner uh, because then you will be experiencing bugs or possible errors much much earlier until it kind of hits production and you know you will be doing, you will be actually testing your deployment pipeline every time you deploy to any environment, really. Um, yeah, and the tools, we kind of mentioned plugins. No, now we're mentioning tools. It's kind of the same kind of thing. There is a lot of tools. Pick one or several set of tools and um, stick to those and use those. Um, architecture is an important thing. When I, when I look at the systems and I have to review some of the systems or have to work with systems and so I kind of, look a lot, I ask a lot, I poke around a lot about the architecture. And, and especially with the legacy systems, you will have this kind of picture. I, I really like this picture because it's kind of, in my head, I mean, it can be a very picturesque picture and everything. In my head and with IT perspective on it, I kind of see a bunch of monoliths going right into the cloud. So this is kind of my twisted probably view of those picture, and this is this is kind of what happens uh, nowadays as well. When we kind of porting everything into containers, we're shoving huge monoliths into containers, putting them in the cloud, and just saying, "Oh well, you know, we're we're cloud ready and whatever." Uh, so architecture is an important thing. There is different aspects to the architecture, obviously, but. Most of the things that is important here is that this your application actually supports continuous deploy in one way or another. Do you have to take it all down to deploy a new version or you can actually uh, deploy it gradually without users noticing and things like that? This is an important thing. This is also part of architecture. Uh, application architecture. So further down in, in the stack of the architecture is also an important thing. How make sure how your application is actually put together, how it's integrated with the other systems, how it actually handles if the other parts of the system are down or third party things are down and things like that. So integration architecture is an important part here. Um, code package structure, that is a very important thing because uh, first of all, it's very easy for us developers to read things and to understand things, but also it's important to, to, to kind of split things up and possibly if you have a big monolith to actually put it into smaller uh, micro, uh, micro services and things like that as well. Um, Tools. First of all, environments. I did mention a little bit about environments. I'll just repeat myself again. Do you actually use the same routines for deploy? This is an important thing. You might want to have small changes and everything. Don't do it on kind of fanatic religious basis, basis and they were like very, very like everything has to be equal or same, but you know, try to do it as, as equal as possible to it's it's always a way off kind of thing you have to see if it's worth it but try to do that because you will see the errors and you will see your like errors in in the pipeline earlier if you do it in the same way so yeah um are all the environments similar i mean again it's very very wishful thinking you i cannot expect you to have exactly the same hardware requirements for your production and your test environment, most likely because it will be probably a kind of expensive thing, but try to make it as, as equal as possible because sometimes you experience bugs based on, uh, I don't know, CPUs, memory, uh, whatever, and those bugs will behave in a totally different way in production with huge amounts of those resources and in a totally different way with a smaller amount of resources in a different environment and stuff like that. So try to make them as as equal as possible again. Um, can you rebuild them with a simple script? If your data center burns down, burns down, can you just press something or run a script or five and just go and grab a coffee and after a few hours, it's everything is just rebuilt. Can you do that? That's a, also an important thing because one thing is it's a kind of, it makes you feel safer, but also it's an important thing uh, from the perspective of creating those new environments. So you can actually create and tear down test environments every time you really need them instead of having them just lying around and waiting for the time when you will be testing whatever you want to test on that environment. Um, same physical hardware. Uh, this is uh, probably on-prem thing and much less likely to be a problem with, with cloud, but still 
um, it's an important thing. If you have actually the same physical environment for different environments, uh, it will break, it can break your stuff. So we've been running like performance tests on test environments and by that managed to take down the production environment just because they both of them were pointing at the same set of network uh, sans, so network disks and stuff like that. And when one environment blocks all the read write access to the disks, your production goes down. So you don't really want to happen to, for those things to happen either, right? Um, monitoring and monitoring all of the environments, exactly the same reason, like I said, for the deployment uh, procedures and stuff like that. Again, you will be seeing errors much earlier if you do it for as many environments as possible, like development and test and everything, pre-production and production and stuff like that. Um, yeah, there's a lot of list of things why things go wrong, but most of them usually point at us humans because we are error prone. We do make mistakes. And uh, automation, automation, automation is the thing that actually helps us to get rid of uh, many of those things again. So um, that might be a very good idea to, to look into that. Tools, um, development tools, obviously your IDE is your best friend. Uh, pick one, stay with one, at least try to stay with one within the team. Uh, it does again, it's not an absolute requirement, but might be a good idea. Um, uh, the good idea is to integrate that with some kind of uh, static code analysis and unit tests and stuff like that, to integrate that as much as possible. You can introduce things like checks and commits uh, if you have some things that are specific to a project that you want to make sure that happens before it ends up in the repository. Uh, you can use build tools. You can use automated tests on different levels. So all levels really preferably at, at some point is within the some, some time frame, 24 hours, whatever. Uh, so unit tests, uh, integration tests, and you know all, all those kind of end-to-end -end tests and all of them. Uh, build tools, so pick one uh, or pick something and stick to that. Again, there's a lot of them. Uh, build tools that help you to build things. There are different ways. So for Java, that would be typically Maven, Gradle, or something else. Pick something, stay with that, and try to use all of those possibilities that that, that uh, framework gives you. Uh, there's a lot of them. I mean, for Java, this is this little funny picture that is a total chaos of a, a, a flowchart. But, you know, this is kind of too more to illustrate that there's a lot of different ones and you can probably pick something that works for you. But, you know, um, picking something that works for you is probably the key here. One last thing before I'm done is I want to talk a little bit about documentation and tools for collaboration. This is an important thing that's being very often forgotten. So that I'm talking about uh, things like a wiki, a chat, or whatever. So uh, wiki can be different things, right? It can be actually wiki uh, systems. It can be, I don't know, Confluence so for the corporate or SharePoint, or whatever. Uh, for the chat, it can be also, again, a lot of different things. A lot of people use Slack or Teams or whatever. And uh, the point is, use some of those tools. And that are, those are really, really useful to have. And uh, also try to uh, hear it's a good idea to stick with one. Uh, so like, for example, I, I was working on a project where we had, um, where we had a, um, I asked them if they had some kind of tool where they put all this knowledge, like collaboration knowledge and you know information about systems. And they said, yeah, yeah, we do. And uh, I've been asking kind of lots of interesting and probably difficult questions earlier. So they were really released. So this is, we can check off. We can actually say yes. And it's like, oh, cool, fantastic. Uh, which one do you use? And they said, guess what? They said, oh, well, you know what? We actually have two. And that when... They were still happy, but then I was kind of on the downhill of this happiness thing. Because if you have two places, say, I don't know, say Confluence and SharePoint or Wiki and SharePoint or whatever, uh, if you have two of those and you need to update something about your system, which of those systems you use to update that information, probably the most likely correct answer is none because you don't really know where to do it and you kind of postpone it, procrastinate, and just leave it somewhere there. So pick one and stick with one and just make sure that that is updated. And don't put too much information into that because, again, it will be hard to update, but you know, just enough to make things running and everything. Uh, when it comes to issue tracking, so this is uh, my drawings again. So this is more of a bug, bug containment system, I guess. But let's talk about bug issue or bug tracking systems instead. And that's the same thing here. Uh, pick one and use one. Again, I was talking to some colleagues of mine, and uh, I was complaining about this project, the same project that had two 
Vickies, uh, they also had uh, also realized that they actually had two bug tracking systems with a person sitting in between and actually syncing them manually because of reasons. Let's don't go there. There was kind of reasonable reasons for that in a way, but you know there were still two systems, and that was a really really bad. And I was complaining to a colleague of mine, and she was like, "Hey, you know what? This is not the worst thing I've seen. I've seen actually three systems with." two different people actually manually syncing between them. So one for the customer, one for the development team, and one for whoever, I don't know what the third group was. Again, very bad idea. Stick with one, use one, and just be there. And you know, uh, this is pretty much the whole, the moving part of it. And one last thing, um, since we mentioned cloud and mentioned cloud native and everything, this is a cloud native definition, uh, CNCF definition of cloud native. and uh, this is kind of the most important th words that I picked out from that definition. And uh, I also tried to split them up in what, how, and why. Uh, what we're developing, how we're developing that, and why we're developing that. And a lot of those words that you see here are actually kind of one way or another are related to the things that we talked about as well. So this is kind of a fun thing that when you see all those pieces fall together. And like I said, again, I'll repeat one more time is that you don't have to do all of that at the same time to see the results. You can actually do it gradually and you can actually even uh, convince uh, whoever is, you know, saying go, no, go to whatever you do uh, as, a, as, as a developer from day to day uh, to do things, to improve things a little bit better and making time a little bit better and showing the progress and then doing more and more and more instead of saying that, well, we don't have any test coverage. Let's go from zero to 100 test coverage. I'll see you in like five years. This is not really going to work, right? So let's hope that you can use some of those tips and tricks and uh, turn them in one way or another and create your own version of this rainbows and unicorns and your paradise for your project. I did write a few things that you can probably uh, find on, or you can definitely find online. So there are a few things about those uh, command line tools that I've used for that I mentioned about like MIME types and, and, and encodings and stuff like that. I did a few, uh, uh, some time ago, I did a kind of a text version of this talk with explaining why and things. So if you want to see it more as in textual form, you can have a look there. Uh, and yeah, well, I guess we'll, we're open for questions if there are any. So I'd love to have any comments, any questions, anything. And uh, yeah, feel free to ping me also on social media. So this is me on Twitter there. And you can also email me or uh, find me in any way, uh, really. My DMs are Okay, Rustam, thank you very much. That was so much information and so much useful information in one uh, 45 minute talk. So thanks a lot. And we have uh, quite a lot of questions, which I would like to ask to you. But first of all, I would encourage everyone to follow Rustam on Twitter, because maybe you can get even more useful information there. And also follow your developers, you have down there, our Twitter handle. So let's Check the questions. Uh, Lucas is asking, mm -hmm. oh, that's quite interesting because it's not, not technical. He's asking, any advice on how to escape stress as a nightmare when coding close to deadlines? So mm -hmm. do you have any personal um, advices? That's actually a very the interesting thing. I guess, uh, I mean, we've all been there and we do promise ourselves that we're not going to get there and we kind of end up there and for one way or another, uh, for one or another reason. But I guess the first step would be to try to understand why do you get that stress? I mean, is it just because you've been pushed to have too much work uh, and you kind of, if you think of agile and you know this way of doing developing things, did you actually commit to too much work uh, for that sprint and now you're stressed before deadline? Or is it because a customer is trying to push too much functionality into that and maybe you should have kind of considered doing this the agile way where you actually commit to a piece of work? Or it can be things like, I don't know, say automation, for example, right? So if you automate things and, uh, and if things are not automated and tests are not automated and builds and everything and when, when things are getting a bit 
heated in a way, right? Because the deadline is coming up uh, and you get a bit stressed, you're more prone to make more errors. So maybe that is a problem. Uh, so maybe you need to automate a bit more. So it can be very many different ways of addressing that. But I, I would guess, I would love to talk more about that. But I mean, first try to figure out why and ping me again, and then we can work more about on, on, on how to try to fix it. I think it's Okay, so there start. we have a topic for a next uh, article <laughs> on your website or exactly. next session at our yeah, event, right? Okay, perfect. So then the next question. Yeah, what has been your worst nightmare as a developer personally, Cheryl is asking if you would like to share with us. Ah, oh, there have been so many. I, I mean, it depends of what you mean. But I mean, usually it's uh, usually it's something with uh, really pushing you, something you, to production. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is, like, usually what uh, kind of grinds my gears uh, some quite quite most most of the time. Like, if I have to generalize a lot, um, probably that would be something that you you're really working hard to automate something and re really trying to make something better and. And people who are actually kind of on the receiving end of that might not really see the point of doing that or might not see the point of why you're spending time on that instead of spending time on something that is visible, like, I don't know, new functionality or shiny new button or, you know, whatever that might be. And you actually have to kind of, you, you really have to fight that to make your project better. Uh, that is probably like mm -hmm. very generalized version of what what is and do you what, have a strategy on how to convince the people then that it makes sense? um it depends again it depends on the people but i guess one, most of the time would be to try to do a little bit so say you have a project that fails at the same place most of the times it fails and then you don't have tests for that little thing. And this is super critical. So try to, instead of convincing your project ma product manager that I'll do uh, test coverage for the whole system and that will cost me many, many hours, uh, try to introduce a, a little bit of testing for that critical thing. And then you can actually say, hey, look, we've been spending so many hours fixing that thing that fails in production every time uh, or 80% of the time. And now we create the tests that will kind of uh, see show us that it might fail before it goes to production. So now our failure rates went to nothing. And now we need to address some other place, some other thing that is kind of our top priority. And then you do this gradually and you show a little bit of value. But this a lot of things also go into like, I don't know, have a look into if you're into SRE stuff, so site reliability engineering, there's a lot of things that can help you there. There is a lot of things that can help you with cloud native kind of way of thinking. So there are different ways of approaching that. But yeah, um, try to show a value of things if people don't like uh to say don't, don't yeah. want to say yes immediately yeah so pointing out the benefits is always a good strategy to convince that's someone. a great question so it's it, that's the kind of fun because it's i usually get very non-technical questions like please help how do i convince someone to do this kind of things and this is, seems to be a kind of common problem i guess Mm -hmm. Okay, then let's see what's... Yeah, Martin is asking, can you recommend some good books for clean code except those of Robert Martin? Oh, um, there is a... There, there are a lot. I mean, there, there is a lot of things. But the like, first thing that comes to mind is uh, those 97 things series might be a good idea to, to look into uh, because they talk about some, some of the common problems that you might have and try to explain. So there is like 97 things uh, all programmers should know, all cloud uh, developers should know, and so on, and so on, and so on. So have a look at those, for instance. Uh, there is also a book, pretty good book about uh, enterprise architecture that talks a lot about like, you know, uh, things related to that, not directly clean code, but also kind of infrastructure branching strategies and all the other things. So, uh, and that's also very kind of very classic book. It's been there for quite some time out there, but it's, if you haven't read through and or looked through that, do that. And uh, also some stuff that has to do with cloud native. I would kind of think it's it will help you that with, with, with this kind of stuff as well. Because it's not only about, pure clean code and making code fantastic, but also it's all, all about this kind of things around it as well. 
Okay, then a very interesting question about a very trending topic currently. Uh, again, from Martin, he's asking, uh, what do you think about the GitHub AI powered code completion tool? <laughs> um, I have not played around enough with that thing to, to kind of say anything uh, specific about it. But I mean, it's in a way, it, it goes in waves, right? I mean, this auto code generation thing, it goes in waves. It gets really popular at some point. It gets less popular and gets back into that. Now we put AI into that to generate uh, code, which is kind of a new cool way of doing that. Before that, we used models to generate that. And before that, we kind of used uh, uh, more kind of some other ways of, 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 of putting things together. But, you know, I I think it might be good for some usage, but I I don't think like with many other things, with most of the things that we actually use, it's not like one silver bullet for everything. So it might not work for all of the things that you develop, but it might be very nice uh, complement to generate some stuff that is, uh, I mean, we used we used that back back in the days when I started working, like early 2000s. We used to there was no rest. We used soap, right? And then we used to generate uh, code that would kind of consume and generate soap based on VSDL, and that was code generation as well, right? And we used that for quite some time, and now it's gone most of the time anyway. And after that, we used models to generate things, and just like classes and and UML models, and just you would generate things. And you know, so it, it it has its usages, but I wouldn't I don't I wouldn't like put everything in it like uh, like most of the other tools as well. Okay, um, Vaida is asking which kind of tests should be prioritized: unit integration or end-to-end? Who? That's uh, um, 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 depends again because it depends on where your where you think the uh, the issues might lie. So if you know that you have very complex logic in your code, you might want to start with unit tests just to make sure that your methods actually returning whatever you want they return to calculate things and you know if you're doing a lot of calculations i don't know working with sets or uh, numbers and you know all these kind of things might be a good idea to start with unit tests but then if you have more issues with integrating things so you might want to start but i would i would say actually start where you see that there is a lot of problems or mostly problems lie and do the other things afterwards, but do not abandon. I mean, don't focus on just one thing, just only unit tests and forget all about it, the other ones. It's better to do it gradually. And please, please, please do not focus on percentage, like coverage percentage or something like that. And make sure that whoever is kind of like project managers, product managers, whatever, they don't focus on the numbers because it's very easy to focus on that, but it doesn't really mean anything if you have 79% uh, test coverage or 81, but it's actually the quality. I mean, I can write really bad tests that will go from zero to 100 uh, coverage in, 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 in like half an hour, but those taste tests will be horrible and they will be totally useless. So, you know, the quality is an important here factor as well. And then, uh, try to, try to think, try to, try to attend whatever is hurting the most, I guess. Okay, Rustam, thank you very much. I would say we are a bit short on time now, but I would take one last question. If I is asking, um, awesome. if you have any suggestions for tools to check coding standard linters or additional static analyzers, um, there there are a bunch. I mean, there there are a few, and also it depends also on 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 the platform that you're using. But there are things like I don't know, uh, like I, I mentioned Sonar Sonar Cube uh, is one of them that has uh, kind of integrated thing. But there's usually in 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 the back it, they would use some other tools like PMD or some other things that, uh, and those tools been there for ages. I mean, there those are kind of getting almost. Uh, I mean, well, they've been there for a really long time. And there is a new tools coming out uh, that are more looking into, because uh, there are a few ways uh, you need to think about that. One of the things is that to make your code and code standard nice and make it readable for humans. But also there is another sp side of it or aspect of it where you where those uh, those kind of solutions can recognize a possible bugs so they can say hey you know what you did this thing and you're doing that here it's very likely that you'll get a null pointer exception or here is very likely that you'll get some kind of unknown uh, security 
security vulnerability kind of uh, thing that you will have, I don't know, say, uh, for front-end cross-site scripting, whatever, or, you know, things, different things can be uh, seen by automated tests. So I don't want, so my point is kind of not to advertise a tool, but I would like to kind of advertise a way of thinking and say, just pick one, uh, test it, see if it works for you. If it's not, cho choose another one. So do a little bit POC kind of proof of concept just to see what works for you. And, and, and don't be shy or afraid to change or complement tools really either. Okay, perfect. Rustam, thank you so much for being a part of the Real Developers community. Um, I hope so much that we will have you see you soon again at uh, one of our events. Um, so too. Um, thank you. Now we're going in a short break, but I want to say like, thank you. And uh, yeah, see you next time again. Thank you very much. See Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye. So as said, we are going into a short break, but before we go into the break, I would like to ruffle out some Mozart Kugel. So it's also a suite here from Austria. And uh, to win one of that, you have, we will pick one, one, one winner with the uh, right answer uh, of the question, where is Mozart from? We are streaming live from Vienna, and most people think he is from Vienna, but actually he is not from Vienna, even if you will uh, find a lot of uh, Mozart people running around the city here. So just write in the chat your answer, where is he from? And then, um, yeah, when we start the next talk, we will uh, pick one winner. So we have five minutes, and then we will see each other again. So see you in a moment. Bye-bye. Have you found your dream job as a developer? Or are you stuck in an unfulfilling job? On wearedevelopers.com, you find over a thousand jobs in Europe that fit the tech stack that you want to work with, and salaries go up to 130K. All you have to do is create a free profile, and you automatically get matched with jobs that fit your requirements. So what are you waiting for? Create your free profile and let companies apply to you now.
Okay, welcome back. So that was a short break, but it was a super interesting session that we had. So I hope that you stayed here with us. And as I promised, we are going to raffle out this Mozart Kugeln. So Vessi backstage picked a winner. It's uh, Patrick, Patrick with CK at the end. So Patrick, please just drop us an email with your mailing address to uh, hello at realdevelopers.com so we can pack it up and send it over to you. Enjoy. Um, so let's get to the next session. Very interesting session with Alexandra from Miro. He is a backend engineer at Miro. It's a very nice tool. We use it uh, at real developers ourselves. It's really cool. And uh, Alexandra has actually started his career as a C++ developer, then switched to Java and uh, helped in Miro, for example, um, to scale it up for uh, to, to several hundred servers. So let's see what he has to say. Let's get him on stage. Hi, hi, Seth. Priyat, Alexandra, how are you doing? Hi, I'm fine. Yeah, thanks. Okay. It's really glad to hear that you use our tool. <laughs> so, um, Alexandra, what uh, what is uh, what are we going to learn from you today? What is your presentation about? Uh, well, my presentation is about the first step uh, at Miro, uh, which we did to turn to the to make a transition into microservice architecture. Yeah, and uh, what we have ended up with, so how to bootstrap the project like using Spring Boot and Kubernetes. Okay, perfect. Looking forward to that, Ron. So, Alexandra, um, the stage is yours. Uh, so, yeah, thanks. H hello, my name is uh, Alexander. I am tech lead at Miro, and I have like nine years uh, of background in Java and mostly it's about developing uh, backend for applied software in different areas like uh, telecommunications and BI. And uh, right now I'm tech lead at Miro and I want to tell you about uh, how to set up uh, your first microservice using Spring Boot and Kubernetes. And uh, uh, when we hear the talk about microservice, you can often hear about their benefits. Well, and that's indeed true. So they can really bring scalability and flexibility into the architecture. But uh, when adopting the, this architecture, you really have to consider all the complexity, either implicit or explicit, that like, comes with it. And uh, there are a lot of things that can go wrong few of them you can see on the slide and you have to like reckon with them. And um, why is it so? So mostly because the requirements for the expertise of the engineers start to increase. And uh, a lot of like new technology is introduced and uh, uh, the system itself becomes uh, more complex, it uh, becomes distributed, dis distributed and uh, yeah, for example, like uh, instead of fast and reliable procedure call, now there is like an, uh, not very fast and unre unreliable network. And uh, each component uh, starts now to affect the availability of the system in whole. 
and uh, these things you have to deal with. And uh, uh, well, to bring you into the context, uh, um, Miro is a company of one product, uh, and uh, we like implement uh, online whiteboarding solution. It's a tool for distributed teams, and the users can collaborate on it, uh, manage their processes, uh, discuss designs, and so on. And the majority of the functionality is implemented in Monolith. And uh, the company have been living with this Monolith for a pretty long time, and I would say pretty successfully. But with the growth of the team, uh, we faced uh, classic problems of Monolith uh, applications, for example, uh, this model it became very complex. Uh, there were a lot of components. They were tightly coupled. There were leak leakages between them, and it was very easy to uh, to introduce and uh, hard to fix such leakage between the components. Also, the build process became slow, and uh, other teams start to influence uh, the. Uh, delivery of your changes to production. So we decided to move into microservice architecture. And uh, 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 we decided to do it from like two directions. One direction is to implement new functionality in my using microservices right away. And the second is to isolate a existing functionality from monolith, uh, well, gradually. And uh, uh, what you face first when thinking about microservices is that you have somehow to uh, uh, distribute your uh, application, your microservice uh, across like multiple service and uh, uh, to uh, well, handle this uh, at scale. And, uh, this really becomes difficult for and requires significant amount of effort from DevOps team. And there are orchestration tools that come to help you. And uh, there are uh, like a bunch of them in the market right now. So for example, Kubernetes, which was originally created by Google and it has a lot of features out of the box like service discovery, network capabilities, uh, scaling your workload up and down and so on. Also um, Apache Mesos, which uh, uh, can run uh, containerized and non-containerized application also in a distributed manner. Docker Swarm, which is built in into Docker and uh, also has a lot of core functionality and some things in common with Kubernetes. Um, Netflix has tools like Titus and Conductor, which uh, they used internally and then open sourced. And also there is HashiCorp Nomad, uh, which can also run uh, containerized and non-containerized applications. And it can be integrated with other HashiCorp products like Console, Vault. Yeah, and it's also an alternative to Kubernetes. And uh, we decided to, to stick to Kubernetes here because it's, uh, well, pretty mature and uh, I, I would say enterprise ready solution. So uh, it is widely used. It has uh, active community and we wanted to make sure that this first step we make uh, is uh, like confident and we, uh, we, we want to eliminate as much risks as, as we can here. So yeah, pick up the solution that fits you best um, and uh, speaking of Kubernetes, so what it what is it? Uh, it's a tool to automate uh, like deployment of your application and to scale it. And uh, it consists of uh, controllers and resources, also objects. And in in short, it uh, uh, it controllers uh, track the state of the objects and make sure that the state is as they as expected. And uh, 
containers uh, run on machines, which are called nodes, in a group of one or more containers, which are called pods. And uh, uh, scheduler distributes these uh, pods across the nodes. And uh, there are also agents called Kubelet and Kubeproxy. Kubelet uh, watchers for, for the state of the pod. And uh, Kubeproxy is responsible for routing traffic for it, so for network uh, capabilities. And uh, they do this by accessing uh, Kubernetes API servers uh, uh, directly. And it's the, well, the interface for accessing Kubernetes functionality, both from inside cluster and from outside of it. And there are also controller manager, which is responsible for operation of controllers themselves and also cloud specific controllers. Um, and this choice of orchestration also dictates like the choice of, of your local environment tools. And there are also several of them, uh, like Kubernetes and Docker, which is uh, mostly for testing Kubernetes itself, itself and it can provide uh, different uh, configurations of cluster. And uh, Minikube, which is uh, aiming uh, for developer friendly setup. Um, there is also micro Kubernetes, which is a third party solution by Canonical. And it also tries to simplify the process of setup. Uh, Kind and Minikube are uh, implemented by uh, groups within Kubernetes project itself. And uh, they have links from the official documentation and the documentation itself like is uh, pretty detailed. And we have chosen Minikube here for local environment um, because it really simplifies the, uh, the work. And uh, also it uh, supports virtualization uh, and can eliminate uh, the differences of uh, different machines, different operating systems. And for example, on Mac OS, it is uh, uh, executed inside virtual machine, which has its own Docker, which uh, runs containers of both Kubernetes and uh, uh, microservices. So yeah, uh, pick like the solution that you uh, that uh, fits your needs uh, if you decide to stick to Kubernetes too. And uh, these orchestration tools are well rather they they are quite important aspect, but they are rather implementation and infrastructure details. So if treated well, they should be like uh, easily replaceable. Uh, and for writing microservice in Java itself, there are also diff uh, like different solutions. Some of them are quite big and uh, like Spring Boot and Lagom framework. Some are based on micro profile, like Open Liberty, Helidon and Quarkus. And some uh, micro frameworks like uh, Micronode and Javelin. And we decided to, to go with Spring Boot here because we already used it in uh, Monolith. So we were familiar with it. And uh, it is uh, much easier to find an uh, engineer who have worked uh, with Spring Boot. So this like, kind of was also the decision to eliminate uncertainty in this first step of transition into microservices. Uh, okay, so let's try to create project and take a look at uh, all the aspects of uh, uh, our implementation and what we have ended up with. Uh, so, Okay, I'll create new project um, using Maven. Let's call it Java Day. Yeah, Maven is just my personal preference here. So, and uh, let's bring some Spring Boot flavor into it. 
So I have prepared some snippets here because if I will write everything like manually, it will take a lot of time. So first we need to introduce uh, dependency on the Spring Boot. And it's, I, I choose uh, Spring Boot Starter Web here just for the sake of demonstration. It comes with the uh, embedded Apache Tomcat server by default. And uh, for demonstration purposes, it's more than enough. And uh, let's also include plugins. So we will use them later. One is to generate uh, Maven wrapper, and another is help plugin. So now let's generate wrapper. And let's create our application. Let's call it Java Day. And uh, let's create our first controller uh, that we will work with. Uh, I call it greeting controller. And uh, what it does, it exposes one endpoint with pretty simple logic. So it returns uh, an object as response with two, two properties, greeting and from. And uh, uh, let's... it on some port example this date um, so what do we need to do to transform this into microservice first we need to build a, a fat jar which includes application itself and all the dependencies and to do that uh, we can use spring boot plugin uh, by the way, probably I should switch into presentation mode. Yeah. And uh, I have enabled uh, layers here. So uh, what, uh, what does it mean? Uh, Spring? splits application into several layers and we can utilize it to build image uh, of our application efficiently and uh, to do that so let's build our application take a look at those layers and uh, also we need to create a Docker image. Sorry. Yeah, I have a snippet here. We can see our uh, fat jar here, and uh, let's like extract layers from it. So there is 
application itself, uh, its dependencies, and snapshot dependencies. Uh, the folder is empty, and also uh, Spring Boot Loader. So to utilize this, we can use Builder pattern for building Docker image. So first we extract uh, these layers, and then we copy them into the target image, like one by one, and uh, we can use uh, Docker hash care. So if the layer is not changed, uh, then uh, it is uh, like taken from cache, and uh, we can put layers which uh, which are changed seldom on the top, and which change often and at the bottom. And also we need to expose our port here. Uh, okay, so and for for the sake of demonstration, I've, I have also prepared a script for building this image. Uh, so it passes uh, the reference to the jar file, uses current directory as the context, and also has a link to the Docker file. So let's run it. And uh, next, we have to deploy this image into the Kubernetes cluster. And to make that, we have to create uh, Kubernetes objects. So let's do that. And uh, uh, what do we need like in the minimal configuration? First, it's the namespace, the object uh, that contains all other objects. We call it Java Day. Uh, the next, it's deployment, uh, which uh, uh, is abstraction that contains pods, uh, which uh, where uh, the container is executed. Uh, the service, the service is the abstraction to expose those pods uh, as a single entity, and uh, also ingress controller, uh, which is responsible for exposing them outside of the cluster. So in the deployment, we have also name. It is uh, uh, created in the namespace we specified. And uh, uh, yeah, so this one we need right now. So we specify here uh, for, for the containers inside the deployment, what image will we use and uh, uh, the name of it. So, and also the port which is exposed by the image. These labels will be applied to the pods and uh, for, for the rolling uh, strategy, uh, these settings tell us that first we need to create uh, one instance with the new version. And uh, only after that, we can like, terminate uh, previous ones. But yeah, let's talk about this later. Um, OK, and uh, service is uh, uh, responsible for like exposing pods by selecting them and uh, has port uh, specified to for, for this exposure. And uh, Ingress utilizes this service and this port and uh, exposes uh, them by some host name. Uh, this host name is the host name I uh, defined for the Minikube. So you can see Minikube IP address here and uh, take a look at hosts. So here, uh, this host name is defined. Um, yeah, so let's deploy it. So we need to create namespace. 
then, then you can create uh, all the other objects. But uh, uh, at this stage, uh, the image will not be accessible. We have to tell Minikube uh, how to get this image. And to do that, uh, we, we can modify our Docker build script. So we pass the image to the Minikube. First, we remo remove previous one if it exists. And we also have to delete deployment uh, because if the image is used by the deployment, it will not be replaced. And uh, the old version will be uh, remained. Yeah, this long process is the actually loading of the image into the minikube. So everything is created and uh, yeah, we can... Uh, the ease of the configuration of the minikube, which I mentioned previously, is this add-ons feature. And uh, uh, for example, for, for this uh, ingress controller to work, we need to enable uh, ingress add-on. Uh, I, I have already enabled it, and uh, Minikube like manages all the underlying uh, resources which are uh, making this uh, add-on. And uh, there is also add-on dashboard, which uh, which is pretty convenient and exposes. Mini Kubernetes dashboard for watching for the deployment for the resources. So we can switch for the Java day namespace, and now we can see that there is our pod. It's 50 seconds uh, running. We can take a look at its logs, and we can access it by Java day greetings. So yeah, here is our payload, um, and um, let's enhance our application. So let's externalize configuration of it. Uh, and to do that, we need to modify our controller. So um, let's introduce properties. Like, and use them inside of the controller. Now, we find default value for it. And uh, uh, to configure this property in the Kubernetes environment, we, we have to create a so-called config map object. Here's how it looks like. So uh, yeah, we created inside Java Day namespace. And uh, uh, to, to make it accessible from the application, we need to introduce another dependency here, which is Kubernetes, oh, sorry, uh, which is Spring Boot Cloud project. And uh, what it does is uh, it creates a new property source, uh, which uses Kubernetes cl client and accesses this uh, config map from from the application. Okay. 
And uh, to make that work, we also need to create some, several new objects to allow our pod actually like grant permissions to access this map. And these objects are role binding and uh, role itself, which tells that we can get config map with the following names. Uh, this is one because we have Kubernetes profile uh, within Kubernetes environment and uh, as it does when uh, scanning like local configuration, it also tries to get all the config maps uh, with, with the current profiles available. And we need service account, which will give this permission. So let's copy it. And uh, this service account needs to be referenced from the deployment. And we have to tell also the name of the map, of the config map we use. We can do this by specifying environment variables. And uh, let's also add a bit of observability to our project. And uh, to do that, uh, we can introduce dependencies to uh, Spring Boot Actuator, which exposes some of the useful endpoints, and also to Micrometer to create custom metrics. Um, so this Actuator project has a useful endpoint, which is uh, metrics and Prometheus, and uh, it uses Prometheus as metrics registry and uh, expose the, uh, all the metrics in the Prometheus format by, by the endpoint, which we can specify in the application uh, config. So here it is. And expose it on ports on port 5000 so we enable these endpoints and uh, expose them on the base pass, base pass management and we need also to modify our docker file to expose this port here and uh, what we have to do else is to add this port also into the uh, deployment and uh, service So we do it like this. And deployment. Now we can expose it in the ingress by some as management okay and to make uh, this work and uh, we need to install uh, kubernetes extension which is called prometheus operator and uh, which helps to operate with uh, prometheus uh, in a kubernetes native manner and uh, this is exactly uh, what uh, what is uh, simplified by Minikube by these add-ons. So uh, instead of manually installing it, Minikube provides this as add-on functionality. So And uh, we 
can also specify resources for our deployment to bring it so it's available to the container next uh, we have to create these uh, new objects which are provided by this Prometheus operator and uh, I have uh, created them in the separate namespace called monitoring so what are these objects um, uh, these are objects for uh, well deployment of the Prometheus itself and uh, all the services that expose it and also Grafana uh, instance uh, which is also exposed by a separate service and uh, yeah it is exposed on host monitoring test so uh, to to allow this Prometheus success uh, services from other namespaces we create uh, cluster role building binding here and we also need the role itself and uh, a service monitor so uh, service monitor is the uh, well, filter for telling uh, Prometheus how to adjust its rules to to gather metrics. Yeah, let me copy. So I think I missed it. So here it is uh, this role. Um, and uh, yeah, let's maybe take a look at what we have gathered here. I hope I didn't forget anything. Did I confuse the name here? Yeah. 
So, now let's take a look at them. Did apply. Yeah, and is applied. service account yeah let's see if that work and then fix so we are probably forget how to specify service account name okay so yeah our service is available we have pods and now let's try to access control so yeah we can See Prometheus. You can take a look at its configuration and see if it sees all the metrics. Yes. Okay, so let's expose your file here. So we need to add our Prometheus data source here. And to do that, we need to see uh, the IP address where it is exposed. It is exposed. Simple dashboard. I have created it in advance, so it's pretty simple. Yeah, and we can see that uh, our pod is running here, and it also uh, responds with the metrics. And we can see that it has like gigabyte of memory available in total, and uh, he respects the resources right away. So it's because we are using 11 Java here and it has uh, use container support enabled by default. But for the non-heap, it is still like more than our resources uh, limits. And uh, what we have to do is we have to uh, specify explicitly the available memory for, for the non-heap. And to do that, we can change the deployment. And uh, add our options. 
from memory. So here we specify the heap ratio, uh, the percentage of uh, uh, memory which will be uh, reserved for the heap. And uh, also we specify the meta space size, the class space size, code cache size, and also uh, don't forget about uh, stack size for the threads. Let's take a look how this uh, will affect the metrics later. And uh, 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 what uh, nice functionality also comes with Kubernetes is the uh, automated monitoring for uh, liveness and the readiness of the application. And uh, Spring uh, Actuator has also endpoints uh, built in, which can be used for uh, setting this up. So you have to enable them in the application by enabling health endpoint and also by including it into the exposure. And we can uh, specify this endpoint for Kubernetes uh, settings. So uh, so there are three probes. Readiness probe, which is responsible uh, for whether the application can receive traffic. Uh, the liveness probe, which tells that the application uh, like is not available anymore and needs to be restarted. And the startup prop, which uh, can be used to suspend check of the previous two when the application starts for like some time, some amount of time. And uh, there are some uh, settings like delay uh, between the be, between the start and the first of of the props, uh, the interval between the props, the ratio which has to be reached before we consider that this prop has changed the state and so on. And they are like pretty the same. So for example, here we tell the application that uh, for uh, like we have to fail six uh, props uh, to consider that this application did not start. So. Uh, assuming that we have one second timeout and uh, uh, 10 period seconds. So this means that we have like one minute for application to start. Uh, and uh, there is also a point which, uh, which is built into this health uh, and uh, it tries to access the state within the Kubernetes cluster and for it to work, we need to uh, send the permissions we granted to the application. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, the tricky part that can be uh, with uh, rolling uh, of uh, releases of your application in Kubernetes is the uh, graceful shutdown of the previous version. Why it can be tricky? Because uh, for example, if we had enough time, uh, I could demonstrate to you that uh, if we have, like, for example, two replicas of the deployment and uh, uh, we have built, like, two versions, for example, one, one is snapshot and the next one is better. And we uh, switch the images of these deployments uh, and by utilizing this rolling update, we will be able to see that first uh, a new, like the third part, the third pod is created. Like we have two pods, then we see that the third pod is created. It is in the state of creating. Then we can see that it is running. And after that, uh, uh, only after it, it is running, the previous pods with the previous version starts to be like terminated. So for example, terminating and then removed. And uh, uh, 
by this like gradual rollout, we uh, obtain all the pods of all the two pods on the new version. But still, with this uh, setup, we will uh, see that sometimes, for example, if we run uh, like G meter and uh, uh, access this endpoint in in an infinite loop, we will see that sometimes we receive uh, a response with uh, 500s like services and available uh, by the gateway and stuff like that. And uh, why is it so? Because uh, this process uh, uh, is uh, done uh, in, well, concurrently. So first of all, we uh, start to like, we have our application running, and at some time, at, at some time, uh, we receive this uh, seek term signal, which tells that the application has to be gracefully sh shut down. And uh, 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 there are two cases, and uh, in one of them, uh, Kubernetes will immediately uh, modify the network. Uh, like settings and remove this pod from the target group of the uh, ingress controller, for example, and do, do not route traffic to it. And uh, uh, these uh, processes happen in concurrency. And uh, this can uh, result in uh, uh, application receiving traffic while already received a sick term signal. The other uh, option here is uh, after we receive sick term and uh, the Spring Boot application uh, has sent an event about uh, that it is not accepting traffic, so it is unready. And uh, only after this failure threshold is reached, the application will be considered unavailable. And uh, only after that, uh, the traffic, like, the process of of removal from from the network uh, target uh, will 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 be start, will be started, and it will take some time too. Uh, and uh, to overcome this, we did uh, like the following: first, we issue uh, first we set up. Uh, Spring to, uh, to gracefully shut down uh, its HTTPI server. And this can be achieved by uh, settings server shutdown graceful and the uh, timeout per shutdown phase. And uh, the next is uh, we have to tell Kubernetes uh, how much time we give for application before we can uh, terminate it like hardly. So it is the configuration and deployment here. And uh, uh, what we can do is, for example, we can add a press stop hook, which will uh, issue a query on our endpoint. And uh, in this uh, endpoint, we can uh, tell explicitly to to stop accepting traffic and uh, wait some time for for all the changes in the network to happen. So, for example, we add. This press stop here, press stop hook here. We copy our endpoints. Uh, they use uh, Spring Actuator uh, endpoint feature. And uh, we can make a property for, for this timeout of, 
of wait duration and uh, specify it in the deployment. So for example, if you have three failures, this one period of seconds. So after three seconds, uh, we will notice that the application is refusing uh, traffic. And we need some time for, for all the underlying network changes to be happened. And uh, that's why we can set up Um, the other option would be to uh, wait inside the sick term, but uh, that's probably not quite convenient. And uh, uh, the other thing uh, I wanted to show is how we have set up gRPC here. So let's do it maybe really quick. Uh, We introduce dependency for uh, protobuf and for GPC. Um, next, we need a protofile, so it can be this same representation of our greeting service. Uh, Alexander, sorry, we are running very short on time. Um, how long would you need more? I think five minutes uh, will be enough, so I will I will not five run minutes. this probably. Um, we also have have some questions going, so maybe maybe you can do it another way. Um, so there was anyways the question, could you publish the source code somewhere so people can look it up uh, afterwards as well? Yeah, that's not a problem, definitely. That would be very nice. And uh, then I would say, yeah, we have at, at sharp 4 p.m. we have to go with the next, uh, next talk, but I would say, okay, um, just move on with the presentation and then, uh, yeah, I will jump in again. Yeah, okay, so uh, when choosing, uh, I would say that when choosing this protocol, pay attention to to also to its features. So there are a variety of these protocols available, like Thrift, uh, flood buffers, uh, uh, and so on. And uh, yeah, they have different capabilities and uh, they have different support by, for example, load balancers. So if we, for example, talk about uh, Amazon and their load balancers, uh, gRPC has like a greater support and uh, they can utilize also HTTP2 features for routing traffic uh, of the requests, not of the connections and that will be also convenient so yeah uh, that's why we have chosen do you able to see the presentation i think yeah let's And uh, don't forget about security because this uh, microservice approach is about containerizing and uh, the application has less borders to, to the host operating system than it would have in virtual machine. And uh, uh, there are like several recommendations which uh, I can give is to verify your Kubernetes uh, like definitions of objects. And there are several recommendations like to keep privileges uh, as least as possible. Do not use standard Kubernetes secrets and uh, do remove all the root uh, privileges uh, from, 
from the uh, containers. And uh, for Docker images itself, the, there are also different tools available for uh, checking uh, either Docker file or the image itself for different vulnerabilities and different bad practices, like also not setting, for example, user and so on. And uh, there are several several general recommendations, like do not include sensitive data into the image, uh, use it as smallest as possible, and uh, yeah, remove root permissions. So yeah, if summing up, so we took this approach of doing first, uh, like with eliminating as much as possible of the uh, risks we face and uh, optimize later. So probably we will uh, take a look next at uh, other Spring Boot alternatives to minimize image size, uh, use different uh, Java virtual machines and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, don't forget about security uh, and don't forget about all the complexity that accompanies this microservice uh, approach because yeah, the development process, if not treated uh, carefully can, can become very difficult. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's what I wanted to share today. Okay, thank you, Alexander. That was quite interesting and very, very useful. <clears throat> so we had several questions about if you could share the source code so people can have a deeper look into it and try it out. Um, so, and anyways, the presentation will also be, is also recorded and will be available on demand on realdevelopers.com. And I would say, let's still uh, take one or two questions uh, if you want. Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, when we talk about security, I think uh, there is a question from Lars. He says, um, I saw you use Snick and uh, I was looking into it too. Can you tell me your experience uh, with it? And uh, also following that, what would be some alternatives? Well, Snick uh, comes uh, by default with the installation of Docker. Uh, I actually did not use so for example, from our security team, we uh, encourage to use different tools like Trivi and Docker. And if you open these tools, you can also, like on the main pages, see the comparison uh, of them with other alternatives. So yeah, you can discover like options, I think, from, from there. I have links to them on the slides. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um... And then the next question, um, are there any best practices to follow when monitoring APIs, REST or GraphQL? Uh, well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, actually, I did not work pretty close with GraphQL APIs, so I probably cannot share any thoughts about this. Uh, considering API, so yeah, uh, you definitely, uh, well, you can split your observations into two buckets. Uh, one are uh, like uh, system, could be system specific uh, metrics like the throughput, the latencies and stuff like that. Uh, probably you can utilize that for uh, different uh, rate limiting and uh, different uh, optimizations. Uh, if you, for example, want to notice that some endpoint uh, like has degraded. And, uh, and the other is the uh, applied metrics. So the metrics of some business logic and that depends on the application itself, I would say. For gRPC, for example, uh, there are also uh, the, it was tricky to set up this monitoring because uh, there were different abstractions that we can enhance. Uh, it's like tracer factory, interceptors, and uh, on the, uh, well, our observation is that only when enhancing both 
of them, we could be able to provide uh, a complete like monitoring of the uh, calls to the gRPC server. Oh. Okay, uh, Alexander, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, I would just encourage everyone to reach out directly to Alexander if you have any more questions. I think it was a very deep but very interesting talk uh, that we can really um, yeah, use to get uh, kick-started in this topic. So, Alexander, thank you very much again and greetings yeah. to you and your team. Thanks, thanks. Sorry about the timing. I tried to compress no problem. as much as possible. No problem, thank you. So we are going in a very short one or two minute break maximum, and then we are jumping right in with our next speaker, Alex Soto, which we are also looking uh, forward to see his presentation. Have you found your dream job as a developer? Or are you stuck in an unfulfilling job? On wearedevelopers.com, you find over a thousand jobs in Europe that fit the tech stack that you want to work with, and salaries go up to 130K. All you have to do is create a free profile, and you automatically get matched with jobs that fit your requirements. So what are you waiting for? Create your free profile and let companies apply to you now.
Okay, we are back with our next session. Uh, we are a bit late, but uh, I think it's totally worth waiting. So I'm happy to introduce our next speaker. It's Alex Soto. He is the Director of Developer Experience at Red Hat. He is a Java champion. He is an author of three books about uh, Java and Quarkus and microservices. He's a contributor to several open source projects. He has a very interesting Twitter uh, profile, so make sure to follow him on Twitter as well. And um, yeah, I'm happy that he's joining us as a speaker directly from Barcelona. So let's get him on stage. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. I mean, really happy to be speaking for my first time here in We Are Developers. Uh, yeah, I'm really happy. And also, I noticed that you've got some old computers uh, behind yeah, you. And l l yeah, let me show you one computer that it, this is the computer that I started a long, long time ago. I've got it here. It's this one. It's, uh, you know, it's a Sinclair Spectrum. It was like 128. Wow. Yeah, 128 kilobytes of memory, right? What so did you do with that? Well, I, I basically I just play games and also I, I program with basic, the basic mm -hmm. language where you do some things like a, a poke. I remember doing poke to write um, values to memory, doing uh, yeah these um, jumps and all these kind of uh, things that it was like almost assemble code it was not that's true because you've got something like draw line or draw arc i remember that you got draw arc to, to draw an arc to the screen so it's not um yeah it was not assemble but you know almost <laughs> yeah i learned assembler in school so i i don't miss that time to be honest to be very <laughs> to be very honest <laughs> okay um you are joining us from barcelona right yeah yeah, because my favorite restaurant actually is in Barcelona. It's called Tantarantana. It's kind of a complicated name. Do you know it? Uh -huh. No. No? Okay. I will send you a link. You have to go there. They have the best truffle burgers in the world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, and so and then, um, yeah, Alex, tell us what, uh, what are you going to show us today? Yeah, today we're going uh, to see uh, serverless. So what is serverless and how you can use serverless when java is your language because we've seen uh in the last years that with serverless on place uh, people tend to think that uh java is not your language for the serverless architectures and we'll see that it's not entirely true that we can still use uh, java in the serverless world and since nowadays, you can say that Kubernetes is becoming the de facto uh, deployment tooling where we are deploying all our um, applications. Also, we'll see how we can use serverless in Kubernetes. OK, perfect. Alex, then um, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. I'm going to start sharing my screen. OK. So we can start. So um, as, as all my talks, everything is open. So if you want to reproduce all my demos, I'm going to share with you here the link. Here, I there is you know it's a GitHub page. Then you can uh, push to the uh, one link that there is at the bottom at the top of the uh, GitHub, and you jump to the HTML page where you'll see all, some of the examples I'm going to show you here today and more stuff. And I also am going to share with you the slides so you can, you know, reuse it, share with your college, you know, whatever you want. So let's start with the, the serverless native Java with uh, Quarkus. My name is Alex Soto. My Twitter is Alex Soto V and my email is asotoy at bradford.com. If you've got any question, just please use the chat and I will, you know, regularly check the chat. And if I see a question, I will try to ask. But if the, your question comes later, feel free to pick me on Twitter or in email. And of course, if you want to be updated with the uh, latest things about Java, Kubernetes, um, Argo CD, Tecton, Istio, and so on, you can also follow me on Twitter. And also, I'm um, the co-author of these three um, 
books, testing Java microservices, Quarkus cookbook, and securing Kubernetes secrets, which is this one is the latest one that I wrote. So let's start a little with some slides, and then we will see cool demos. The first thing is, what is serverless? And probably you've read a lot about what is serverless, what's not. We at Red Hat. We think that serverless doesn't mean that there is no servers because the servers are still there, right? What we mean with serverless is that we do not require service management. So we, let's say as a developers, we are free to deploy your applications without having to think about where they are really deployed. We don't care if my service or my application is deployed in this physical server or this other physical servers. I don't care about if I need to uh, configure an HCI proxy or a rubber proxy, or I need to configure a DNS. I don't care about this. I just want to deploy my application and my application be there up and running. This is the first thing that we think that is serverless. The other thing, and that's really important, is that all workload or application is executed, scale it, and built in response to the exact demand, which means that if we do not have any traffic, we have no traffic, because maybe it's night, right? I mean, we've got some application that's running from, uh, from daylight, but then when it's night, nobody access to the application. So why the application should be there running? They could be stop, okay? Or let's say pause. So, until we do not have another request, the application could be there just waiting. And if it's pause or it's if stop, means that our cloud provider cannot build for something that is not running. So means that using serverless makes all applications cheaper. And also it happens on the other way around. What's happened if I've got a peak of traffic, I start, uh, I start receiving a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of requests. What it can happen is that my application can scale up automatically. This is for us in Red Hat, the definition of serverless computing. And we can think about two models nowadays. One is microservices, another one is serverless and functions. And usually we can think about what do we think uh, our, our application or services should be? A microservice or a serverless? Of course, the answer is depends on, and you can mix both. In fact, some of our customers, they are starting doing this hybrid or mixed architectures where there are some parts that are microservices, other parts that are serverless or functions. But in summary, if you want to control your application, you want to control when your application is deployed, where it's deployed, um, you want to control how to access the application, the DNS, uh, the HA proxy, all this stuff, then microservices is your architecture. If your services are long life processes, so they're going to be there running for months, you already know the, pro the programming uh, model, usually you can know, think of it's Java, Go, JavaScript, whatever, okay? And also, usually, I know that it's not mandatory. I know that there are also microservices running even driven architectures. Usually, the microservices architecture uses a request response uh, approach. REST API calls, most of the time, it could be also gRPC, but most of the time you send a request and you wait for a response. Then if you are, want to do all this um, stuff, then go to microservices. But what's happened if you want that the cloud controls your application, it controls how you can access, it controls when to scale up, when to scale down. Usually these processes, these services are short life. It means that maybe, you know, you stay, they, are, they are up and running for eight hours and then they are stopped because there are no traffic or sometimes they are up and running for days, but you update them regularly. Maybe every two, three days, you are updating that service. Then serverless or functions is a good 
way. And I would say, again, the same thing. I've seen serverless functions approaches using uh, request and response communications, but usually in serverless, you've got even driving asynchronous communications. Okay, so in this slide, you can see when to choose microservices, when to choose serverless. And of course, since our, let's say, de facto tool nowadays for deploying services is Kubernetes, maybe you're wondering how I could make my Kubernetes workloads be serverless. And the answer is Knative. Okay, Knative, this is the site, github.com slash Knative, is a project from Google, it was announced in 2018, so it's a mature um, technology that lets you deploy and manage serverless workloads in Kubernetes. But it has two big things you need to be aware. The first one is that they are not adding anything new to Kubernetes. It just uses the base primitives that we have been using for a long, long time. So you are using deployments, you're using services, you're using uh, replica set, you're using pods, so nothing new. And the second thing, and that's for me a key point, is that my serverless um, workloads are container based, which means that you can run them in any cloud. Because keep in mind this what's happening if I've got a project that is running in Amazon and I'm using AWS Lambda, and someday I need to move my project from Amazon to Azure. And maybe this movement happens because in the country where I need to deploy my application, there is no Amazon data center. Then what I will need to do is migrate this AWS Lambda to Azure functions. So there is a migration process. But notice that if you were using Knative, since it's container based, it means that you just need to move one container from one place to another place, and that's all. So what are the interesting capabilities of Kennedy? You can scale to zero. Notice that this is something weird in the case of Kubernetes, because we just tend to think that we usually have at least one pod. But with Kennedy, you can scale to zero which means that there is no pod. If there is no pod, it means that you are not using CPU, you're not using memory, which means that, of course, your cloud provider cannot bill for that. But also you can scale from zero. What's happening if we've got a, a traffic spike? We start having a lot, a lot, a lot of requests. Then automatically k starts and pods. Another capability is that you can also um, have configurations and revisions so you can implement things like blue green deployments or canary releases and Knative works for request and risk so for synchronous communication request and response and also as an eventing system but and here is the problem we said that we can scale to zero and automatically when we've got an, a spike or when we've got one request the pod is started automatically. And what's happened with Java? Yeah, with Java happens that since we need to boot up the, the Java virtual machine and boot up the server and, you know, and allocate all the Java objects and so on, the process takes like two, three, four seconds to boot up. And if we want to use this kind of technology in serverless, obviously, seems that it's not the best way to do it because all customer or user if it's the first one to send a request and the pod is not there it will need to wait like four five six seconds until the pod is up and running but this changes with quarkus quarkus it's a new project i mean it's open open source apache v2 and um this his um main uh, quote 
or the late motif or quarkus is supersonic super dummy java because it's boots and runs super fast it uses a small footprint of memory and at the end it's java and notice that this makes java the perfect match for serverless just here there are some numbers you can see that uh, quarkus uh, application compiled to native it boot up in 16 uh, milliseconds okay uh, where the same example in other technologies takes like four seconds and here we can see also the memory you see that a quarkus native application just a rest application uses 12 megabits of memory in contrast of for example, 1,036 megabytes that we could use in any other um, technology. So if you want to start with Quarkus, you just need to go to code.quarkus.io and start coding. Let me go to the site, this code.quarkus.io, which is from here. Currently, the version is the number two. two. Uh, we can set the group ID and also the artifact with the serverless. And then you can choose what we want to use, for example, Ajax RS endpoint. Uh, we could choose, for example, Ibernate if, if we are interested in using JPA or gRPC if we want to use gRPC communication. Or I don't know. I mean, there are a bunch of, of them. Of course, we could also use AWS um, Lambda. If you want to implement an AWS Lambda in, in Java, you can also do it as well. But of course, you are sticking you're getting a vendor locking with lambda with amazon lambda but it's still possible also with azure functions uh, it's somewhere over here azure functions okay you know that it's a full of opportunities there and then finally you can do just just generate the application and the application is generated and if i'm going here and i do an unzip of serverless Okay, now I can go to serverless. And basically, I don't want to spend much time on this because at the end it's just Java. And I, and I, want, and I prefer that you see all this stuff in action. Um, you see that this is a, a, a simple Java project, source main Java that works in Maven. But of course, you could choose here, if you, if you see here, you could even choose uh, uh, Gradle. So if you are brave enough, just try, try Gradle. Um, let's let's go again here, and you see that it's just a JAX arrest endpoint, nothing else. And you see here that I'm importing the JAX arrest um, um, annotations, and I prepare or I do a REST endpoint. And keep in mind that I could do the same thing, but using a spring annotations. I can go here and do, do an, a spring, and you see that I've got a Quarkus a spring uh, web API. If I added this extension, then, okay, then my code will be uh, using, or will be using, yeah, the spring boot or spring web API annotations instead of the JAX RS one. So if you feel comfortable with JAX RS, that's fine. Add the JAX RS um, uh, extension. If you're not feel comfortable, no worries. Just add the Spring Web API, and you will be able to use the Auto um, REST controller, uh, get uh, value, Auto wired, and so on. Okay, now. I've got here my application. Then I will comp I would compile this application using Maven, and of course, to be able to boot up with milliseconds and using just tenths of megabytes, I will need to use GraalVM to compile my Quarkus application to native. And this process takes like around two to three minutes, and I don't want you to get bored here watching just log lines of compiling the Java application to an edit. And I've already have this application compiled. And uh, it's in the Knative tutorial. Remember that I already shared with you this GitHub repo, so you can reproduce 
all the things that I'm going to show you today. Um, and if I remember correctly, uh, in this tutorial, you'll see how to use Knative and Java with Minikube, but I'm pretty sure that if you, if you use any other uh, Kubernetes cluster, like for example, Kine, K3S, or AKS, I'm sure that it's going to work as well. So let's just start. Um, the first thing is deploy the application, the Hello World application that I've shown uh, with you. Let me um, go here. I think that it's in apps, Twitter, Java, Quarkus. No, it's not here, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's service, I think. Service? Mm -hmm. No, basics. Yeah, because it's a basic. OK, here you'll see a YAML file. Here it is, the YAML file. It's, a, it's of kind of service, but see that the service is of type Knative. And OK, it's pretty much compact than a, the, a Kubernetes deployment. Why? Because remember that I said that most of the things are managed by the cloud. So if I go to microservices and I use Kubernetes, vanilla Kubernetes, let's say, in this way, I need to specify a lot of things, right? The, re the replica set, the deployment, the pod, uh, the service, the, Kinetic, the Kubernetes service, and so on. In the case of Kinetic, I do not need to set anything. I just said that I want to do a Kinetic service with the name, the image, and the liveness and the witness proof. And I just need to do a kubectl apply minus z basics service. OK, meanwhile, uh, let me do here a watch. And you see here that the greeter service is starting. Of course, the first time it takes a bit of time because you need to download the container images. So it takes a bit, but no worries. See that now it's up and running. And if I do a kubectl logs of this timer, you see that this application started in four milliseconds. This is a Java application, in fact, is this Java application, and just boot it up in four milliseconds. Notice that now the application is up and running, and I and you said, "Hey, Alex, you you told me before that with Knative you can scale up to n pods, or you can even scale scale to zero pods when there is no track. and that's true. By default, um, Knative uh, starts the process when you deploy it and wait uh, for 60 seconds. This is the default value. You, you can change it, of course. And if in 60 seconds there is no request, then it's a scale to zero. In fact, notice that it's happening right now. Notice that the pod is automatically terminating. Um, see that I can do kubectl get services. And you see, there are some kind of services out there, like this greeter service and all this stuff. Remember that I said that Kinetic just uses the Kubernetes, um, uses the Kubernetes um, bits. So it uses a service. I can also do a kind of get deployment. And just here, there is deployment, which is called Kitter 0001 deployment. OK, that's fine. And yeah, you could even do kind of get a rest, and you see that there's also a replica set. So everything is on place. But for any case, you know, since there is no traffic, my pod is terminating. Now, let's send a request. I'm going to do KN, KN service list. Uh, KN is a CLI tool that allows you to interact with key native. And what I want you to notice here is that there's a service greeter. Yeah, of course, I've named it here greeter. So it's name it greeter. And it gives me a public URL. Remember that I said that I do not want to spend time with serverless uh, defining uh, URLs, defining DNS, defining ports, defining anything. I want to be automatically done. And this is the URL. So now we can do a curl to this URL. Oops. I think I miss HTTP. OK, and notice how automatically the service was booted up and the message was returned. Notice that I've not done anything. The simple, simple 
my uh, my pod was down because it elapsed 60 seconds without traffic, so it was terminated. And when I received another request, then it just built up the pod and processed the request. Since this is a Quarkus project compared to Netic, it runs pretty fast. But keep in mind the same example, but using other Java technology. We can even, we can even try it, if, if you will. We can do KN create TN service. Create, I'm going to do another uh, another um, Ritter uh, SV. And what I'm doing is just using KN to deploy another Knative service. In this case, it's in a Spring Boot uh, application. And notice how everything is being uh, created automatically. See how um, the configuration is working. The route is created automatically. There is a configuration for Ritter SV for a revision because we'll see in the in the following example that we can uh, have several revisions for our service. And yeah, in a bit of time, and see that now it takes a bit of more time. Finally, we've got the Ritter SV uh, service up and running, and yeah, you see here the ingress has been configured as well. Everything happens automatically. That's the key point of serverless. I'm not configuring anything manually. I'm a developer or I'm a DevOps and I just want to have my application there. Here you see that the greater one, since there was no traffic, it's terminating. And if I do create service list, now you'll see that there is two Kennedy services. One that is the greater one, which is the Quarkus one, and another one which is the greater SB, which is greater Spring Boot, compiled using the Java 11 or 14, I don't remember now exactly. And in a few moments, you'll see how this, um, this um, process or this pod is terminated. I'm going to check if there is any question. Meanwhile, I'm going here to the comments. No, I think. Okay, I think that there is no questions. Okay, that's fine. I mean, we will have some time at the end, but just now. If you've got any questions, just use there. Okay, now see that my Spring Boot application is terminating, and I'm going to do a curl of this Spring Boot application. And of course, now it's going to take a bit of long time. This is exactly the same example that I, that I've deployed with Quarkus, but in a Spring Boot. And now you see that it took a bit more of time to get the, um, the response. In fact, I can do keep cut out logs um this you see user container and you see that it took four seconds to boot up a simple hello wall done in rest in contrast again if you want i can do the same thing with quarkus one you'll see how the quarkus one is here uh starting really quickly came the um the result and I can do user container and exactly the same example took four milliseconds to get up. Okay, now let me do a key and service delete min all minus all all. So I'm just removing everything. And let me show you another example. Let me show you how we can deploy two versions of a service and send in traffic to one or another one. Um, let, let me do keep cattle apply minus F basics uh, service V1 and then I'm going to do the same for the service V2. Okay, now I can do a bat if you want to see. You see the mm, oops, basics uh, service V1. You see that the service V1 is the same that we've seen before, and the service V2 is fairly the same, but I'm just setting an environment variable with the message prefix namaste. So this version two, instead of returning hi, it returns namaste. Now, what's happening if I do key and revision, revision list? It says that there is one service named greeter. See that the greeter, the name, it's exactly the same in both cases. And I've got V1 and V2. And 
100% of the traffic is sent to V2. Yes, of course, it's uh, V2 and it's 100% of the traffic because it's the largest one that I deployed. Now I can do can service a list and you see here there is a greeter and say that the largest is greeter V2 and I can do a curl, curl of this. And I'm getting Namaste because remember that I said that this is the version two. What's happening if I want to switch to version one? So I want to implement the blue green deployment. Then I can do this next thing. Let me go to basics, uh, service pin. And you see here at the bottom that I'm setting here a traffic section where I say that my current tag is greater v1 and I want to send 100% of the traffic. The previous tag was greater v2. And now the traffic is zero and the latest one is zero. So I'm not sending any traffic. Notice that I could put 100% or 80-20 or 50-50. So I could even do a kind of release. Um, let me do a Kif cuddle apply, oops, apply minus F, basics, um, service pin. So now I'm just sending all the traffic to V1, as you can see. Uh, wait, I've uh, done it correctly, I think so. Okay, now, and if, if I do KN revision list, you see that all the traffic goes to greater V1. So of course, if I do a curl to the same URL, now I'm getting high instead of namaste, because I'm just have this concept of revision in Kinetic that I can create revisions and send traffic to one revision or another. Let's do a service uh, service delete again. And let's move to another example. Because we've seen here that we can scale to zero. When there is no traffic, it scales to zero. So our cloud provider cannot bill us for something that is not running. And when we get a new request, automatically boot up. But what's happened when I must start getting more and more and more traffic. Uh, let me go here to but um, let me well let me let me deploy it first. So we've got so while it's deploying and so on. Uh, I think that it's called uh, bum, 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 scaling and it's service uh, 10. So it's let's let's um, deploy this service now. I'm going to explain it. Okay, now it's a bit, it's exactly the same thing, but the image is different. And the image is different because it's a prime generator. So it's a, it's a uh, Quarkus project that calculates prime generated prime numbers. Okay. And finally, there is this annotation, which is auto scaling connected that slash target 10. What we are saying here with this annotation is that when I've got 10 requests, or 10 concurrent requests against the same pod, then scale up the pod. So create a new pod. Then if we've got 20, we scale up to another pod and so on. Now, uh, let me, let me, let me do, uh, I think that, uh, let me uh, create the, the follow thing. It's let's create a lot of traffic. And to create a lot of tra traffic, I'm going to use hey. And uh, I think that everything is okay. Here, I'm just saying that I want to send 50 concurrent requests during 10 seconds. So let's do it. Notice how automatically the system is scaling and it's creating more and more and more pods. You see in the, in the bottom of the screen, how we are creating automatically more and more pods because I'm sending a bunch of requests. So since I'm getting a lot of traffic, I'm just starting automatically, auto scaling all the pods. Of course, I know, I know that here I set it to 10 and it's not a real number. Usually maybe you would put here 1000 or I don't know, depending of, of your, of the service, maybe 10,000. I don't know. It's something that you need to figure out and tune what is this magic number for each of your services? Okay. In this case, I put it 10 because it was for demo purposes. And you see that in uh, one minute, the system will automatically start scaling down. I'm going to check if there is any question. No, there's no questions. Maybe I'm not saying, oh, I see that maybe I shared in the wrong chat. Hmm. 
Okay, something that I can, uh, no, I, can, I cannot fix it. <laughs> okay, no worries. I mean, here you can see also the links and the end of dev slash k native master, and then you get it or everything. Or I will share with you at the, at the end. Hey, Alex, just yeah? just a quick information. The questions are not shared in the stream yet. That's just okay. our backstage streaming thing. So I will uh, tell you the questions from the event itself uh, afterwards. OK, no, uh, OK, that's fine. Uh, okay. Uh, One question, yeah, um, well, it's, yeah. it's not related it's, it's, to, to yeah. the piece right now, but it's uh, from, from Kev91. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on AOT ahead of time? Ah, OK. Uh, well, um, yeah, you, you, uh, IoT, you, you mentioned uh, things about edge computing. And this is something that I'm, I'm not an expert, but um, yeah, there, I know that there is some uh, Kubernetes implementation for edge computing, at least in Red Hat, we've got one. And then you can use Knative without any problem because Knative is built at top of Kubernetes. So any Kubernetes that works on edge computing then it can also work with uh, Kinetic. And also, if, you're, if your question comes because of, maybe it's not in this way, but in the, that IoT can send a lot of events, uh, let, uh, let me tell you that um, Kinetic also works with events. So for example, here I'm just, sending you, uh, I'm just showing you um, synchronous communication, but if you follow the tutorial that I share with you, in fact, we can, you can see here, um here uh, let me go to i think that's an event team okay you see that uh, there are uh, also the example and uh if i show you this but my kafka source here what i'm saying is that every event that is sent to this kafka cluster in this topic then send the event to this k native service so automatically knative is just uh listening the kafka topic and when there's a new event it just sends to the knative service and this means that the more events you're sending to this topic automatically knative will spawn more and more pods and if there is no events then it will start scaling down until you arrive to zero so um with yeah i don't know if i mean i think i covered both of, of how i can interpret the question but yeah let's say that um for iot if you're thinking about running uh, pods on the iot device i know that it's possible and since skinnery it's kubernetes it works and if it's about the amount of events that an iot device can send you can also uh, also work with kennedy in this way using the Kafka source and the eventing system. And finally, I see that after this 60 seconds without getting any event, the uh, system is scaled down to zero. So I think that uh, that's all that I wanted to show. Remember, well, I can just share with you the screen again so you can see the links, the end of that slash Kenya tutorial. I'm sorry. And the end of that slash Knative master. In fact, if you go here, you go to the GitHub, and when you push to this link, you'll see here the Knative serving. This is all the things that I've sh shared with you. And this is the Knative eventing. That is the uh, example that I told you in a, in a few seconds where you can use, for example, Kafka or GMSQ or RabbitMQ or wherever to react to these events. Okay. Okay, Alex, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed it. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, um, so let's see if we have other questions. Um, there's some new questions. So Akira is asking, how would you debug a Quarkus app in production? Well, yeah, uh, in the um, yeah, this is. Uh, I, I would say that the the common common way to do that in Kubernetes is using telepresence. Uh, telepresence is a tool that lets you deploy on production or in Kubernetes clusters uh, your um, 
your services. There are a bunch of examples of using telepresence with Java or with Go or with uh, Node.js, I guess, or with Python. So there is examples. And then basically what you're doing is connecting your computing to the Kubernetes cluster, the, the container that is running, and then you can debug the book uh, remotely. So when you send a request, you will start the process. Problem that you might get, it's true, is that what's happening if you are not sending requests to that process and then it dies, then you can either have, you have two ways of fixing this. The first one is increasing the time. So instead of putting 60 second put one day. And the second way is just create a daemon that is sending one request from time to time. But yeah, that's how you could debug these generative things. Or since it's a container, just create a pod with that container. I mean, a regular pod, not a native ser uh, service pod, and then debug it. OK, thank you. And then there is another question from David. He is asking, um, with some cloud scaling a pod takes some time. Is there a way to avoid this and make it run as fast as uh, kubectl? Uh, uh, in the, uh... You mean a time to deploy? Yeah, well, at, at the end of time of deploying, it's, it depends on a lot of things. First one is if the image is in the in the worker node or not. And then it's, uh, assuming that everything is there, then it's also the boot up time that it depends on the language and how it has been compiled. Uh, what else? Uh, going fast. Yeah, then in case of Kinetic, you can avoid um, having these uh, boot up times and you can always have a pod up and running. So you uh, you have a warm uh, boot up times as well. OK. Um, then uh, Andrea is asking, in the example you showed us before about Kafka plus uh, Knative, what, uh, what about failure? Yeah. Well, um, um, I mean, that if it, uh, it it's not different as any other uh, Quarkus application. Uh, I uh, sorry, any Kafka application, any application that's consuming Kafka. So you send the event to the Kafka topic, and then this e event is sent to the service, and then you receive that event as a Kafka event, and then yeah, if it's there is some any any error, then yeah, you need to act accordingly. What I don't know is what's happened if there is a problem between um, the communication between the Kafka broker and the service, but I guess that automatically it uses ACKs. So you can assume that if you receive the event or, or if you don't, re if the Kennedy service doesn't receive the event, then it's going to be retried automatically. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so it's uh, basically, we are a bit short on time again, but I think it was a super interesting presentation. Um, Alex, maybe for the future, what could be some other topics that might be connected and interested for developers to look into? Uh, yeah, for developers, I would say that um, serverless is one thing, Istio is another big thing in, for Kubernetes and developers. And uh, yeah, recently, I, I, I really love. And I think that all developers should be aware of GitOps. So things like Jenkins X, Tecton, Argo CD. Argo CD is amazing technology for deploying uh, applications to Kubernetes. So um, yeah, I think that that uh, as a developer, uh, nowadays I'm just uh, taking a lot of time on the, the, all these GitOps technology. Yeah, that's that's true. There's, there's like quite a lot of happening there with GitHub. So uh, definitely some topic uh, that we will cover also at the Real Developers Live series. Um, yeah, I would just like, you know, to ask everyone to follow Alex Soto on, on uh, Twitter. I think your handle is Alex Soto B, right? Yeah. OK, so because it's quite interesting and maybe we can still learn something from him in the future. And I would be very happy if you join us again in the future, Alex. Sure, and hope that someday uh, in a physical level. Absolutely, absolutely. We are all looking forward to that one. So Alex, thank you very much. And see you again uh, next time. Thank you very much and stay safe.
You too. Okay, we are going into a very short break of just a couple of minutes and we will be back at 5 p.m. Uh, sharp again with our last session of the day. Very much looking uh, forward to that one with Moritz Kamara from QAware and we will talk about Micronaut. So stay tuned and stay here. So see you in a couple of minutes. Have you found your dream job as a developer or are you stuck in an unfulfilling job? On wearedevelopers.com, you find over a thousand jobs in Europe that fit the tech stack that you want to work with, and salaries go up to 130K. All you have to do is create a free profile, and you automatically get matched with jobs that fit your requirements. So what are you waiting for? Create your free profile and let companies apply to you now.
So welcome back to the last session of our Java day. Um, we are going into the last talk and it's an honor to announce our next speaker. It's Moritz Kamera from QAver. He's a software architect and he is very passionate about cloud native, uh, which he spends also the most time with recently. And he's also the author of several open source projects. So let's welcome Moritz. Hi, thank you. Moritz, how are you? Great. It's lovely weather. Nice yeah. talk. Um, Nick. Unfortunately, no clouds, but we're talking about clouds now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, that was a super, very good joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Moritz, uh, tell us a bit about your presentation about Micronaut. So what, what are we going to learn today from you? So we are, we are going to take a look at Micronaut, which is a framework when, in which you can write microservices with. Um, uh, they the promise that they are starting faster than the, the shooting star of microservices uh, Spring Boot. And we are going to take a look if this holds and how, how to develop Micronaut web services. And then we take a look at AgroLDM at the end. OK, cool. Sounds interesting. So I would say the stage is yours, Moritz. OK, thank Go you. Ahead. OK, so a little bit about me. I did my computer master's in computer science in 2013. And then I started working at Coabia in Munich. And now I'm an expert software engineer, still working at Coabia and Munich and working on backend stuff, mostly in Java, which is exactly why I'm you know, qualified to talk about the Micronaut stuff. So the first thing we are going to ask is, why are we using the cloud? And there are more than enough reasons, but uh, two big reasons are um, the cost. So we are migrating stuff to the cloud because then we can, for example, scale elast elasticity. We can scale to zero when we don't need the services and we can scale up if there is more demand and we just pay for that demand. So um, this is common knowledge, but what's the problem when we are writing our services in Java, for example, in Spring Boot, and then we are deploying that stuff on our, for example, Kubernetes cluster. So one of the problems is um, if you take a look at the log files when they are starting up, you see it started in like 13 seconds or it started in 27 seconds. And 27 seconds, if you want to scale to zero, is a real problem because then your customer has to wait for 27 seconds to uh, to get the first request, to get this request served. And I bet no one is willing to to wait 27 seconds uh, until this request is, is served. So. Therefore, startup times in the cloud actually matter if you want to scale to zero. Of course, you, you can always scale to, to one pod, but then you are all, always paying for that stuff. The question is, why does it take so long to start a Spring Boot time, uh, to start a Spring Boot service? Um, common knowledge is it depends on the number of beans in the context, OK? Um, it, it's, uh, Spring Boot is, is reading bytecode on startups. So if you have big classes, it takes longer. It creates proxies at runtimes. For example, if you put at cacheable or at transactional on, on, on your methods, uh, Spring will create proxies to wrap around that stuff to start the transaction and commit the transaction. Um, they do runtime AOP. Uh, this is aspect-oriented programming. You can wrap another class and do, for example, logging or caching or transaction stuff. It does reflection at runtime, for example, for dependency injection. And it also creates annotations on, on the startup. For example, if you have in inherited annotations and all that stuff, it's it's doing on startup. So it just takes time. The memory usage of a Spring Boot application, they are caching all the reflective stuff. So reflection is considered slow, though they are caching stuff. So this is always, um, it's faster, but it takes more memory. And another problem is if you have ever debugged in a Spring Boot application, and you see that they are very, very long stack traces, in the servlets and servlet filter and all the stuff like that, and Tomcat at the bottom, and then somewhere in line or stack 100, there is your code. Um, and Micronaut has a problem with all of that, and they are trying to fix that. What is Micronaut? So Micronaut is, is a modern JVM base, so it runs on the JVM like Spring Boot does, full stack framework, so you can do everything with, with Micronaut, which you can always also do with Spring Boot. You can render views and stuff like that. Building modular, easy testable microservices and serverless applications. So they all they they cater also the serverless space, which you heard about uh, with, for example, with Quarkus. Um, the, the the stuff they are promising you is the startup time is really fast. It is really fast. The the whole system is really fast. It has a high throughput, 
and the, the, the memory footprint is, is really minimal. And I, I read that slide or I read the, the stuff on their homepage and asked me, okay, how, how do they achieve that? Is it, is it really? Does it work? And how do they achieve that stuff? The idea is all the stuff which, is, which Spring Boot is doing on runtime, they do at compile time. The, all the proxy stuff, all the dependency injection stuff, all the IOP, why are you doing this on the runtime when you can also do this in compile time? Because you just you compile it once, but run it often. Yeah? If you scale your Kubernetes pods, then the same code is just duplicated and started second time, third time, fourth time. So it's compiled once and run often. That's a trade-off. That you, you, compile, you do more compile time and less on runtime. But the goal is no reflection or as little as possible. They have no proxies generated at runtime. There is a minimal startup time, minimal resource usage, and they have readable stack traces. So we are going to take a look if this really works. Um, the technical details how the stuff is work is they have an own annotation processor. Annotation processor is essentially a plugin into the Java compiler which reads annotations and creates then more bytecode in the compile phase. It creates new classes, but uh, the annotation processor from Micronode is, is wired in a way that does, it doesn't touch your code, it just extends it. Okay, so your, your code isn't transformed in a magically way, they just extend your class and do stuff around. In Gradle, you can edit stuff with the annotation processor, and in, in Maven, it also works, but you just paste 500 kilobytes of XML in there, and then the annotation processor is running when you are compiling your Micronaut application, and then all the stuff is generated, like the proxies and the AOT and these and the reflection stuff. Um, this is a screenshot from my target folder. I just have written those files, application, cache warmer, this stuff is from Graal, a project DTO and project controller. And this stuff here with the dollar signs in it, this is generated by the Micronaut annotation processor. So it generates uh, quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of um, more bytecode and classes. So, and I was thinking, is this stuff really working? Um, so I tried it with um, an older Micronaut version, actually, because the, sl the, sl the slides are quite a, bit, a little bit older. Um, I, what, I, what I did is I wrote software which created the um, source code for beans. I just did an empty class, put a component on it, which registers it at a Spring Boot bean, and then started the application. With zero beans, it takes one second, and with 16,000 beans, it takes nine seconds. Okay? I did the same with Micronaut. Zero beans, it, it starts in one second, so it's comparable to Spring Boot, and with 16,000 beans, it takes actually 15 seconds to start. So this is strange because Micronaut just promised me faster startup time. So hmm, what's really going on there? Um, we just debunked the myth. It's not the class path scanning. Okay, so the class path scanning from the, all the component stuff, this isn't is not so expensive. Um, it's actually quite fast, and the injection with reflection stuff, so that reflection is is slow, is is quite of a is quite of a myth because the JVM is optimized for that stuff because every Java framework is doing like reflection, and um, therefore the engineers had optimized for that stuff. What's really expensive is is class loading. So the JVM has to load the class, verify the bytecode, and and stuff like that. But Micronaut is also doing this. So Micronaut and Spring is doing this. But Spring creates the runtime proxies, annotation synthesizing, big classes, and um, Spring Boot is also doing the auto configuration magic. For example, configuring your Postgres connection pool if you drop uh, the Postgres driver in it. Um, so most of the expensive stuff is done in Micronaut compile time. But um, this is this was this wasn't a real benchmark because I I, I just put empty classes in there, which is fast in Spring and in Micronaut. Okay, so, so the idea is generally um, do all the stuff, the expensive stuff, like this one here, runtime AOP proxies at compile time. Okay, so, so the idea may, may hold. We, we take a look at that later. So does this have no disadvantages? And the problem is every time someone is selling you a silver bullet, uh, be, be aware. Uh, one one really good tweet I read is oh, a good developer is like a werewolf afraid of silver bullets. Okay, 
silver bullets are there are always trade-off there is always a trade-off somewhere and the trade-off here in micronaut is you build it stuff with maven and you have uh in spring like eight seconds build time but the annotation processor is running with Vixen K themes takes like five minutes okay so the price you pay is the compile time your compile time will get longer if you use micronaut okay so what's what's up with this with those strange startup numbers that spring is starting faster with thick and KV like uh, the micronaut uh, because this was not a real benchmark um if you take a look at this at the code which i shown in the first slide like which did 27 seconds of startup it's not class loading and stuff like that it's spring auto configuration magic configuring the whole application with uh, checking which classes on the club path and configuring all the Spring Boot stuff. And the startup of a Spring Boot application really depends on the needed feature of your application. For example, if you put the actuator on it, which does metrics and stuff like that, and uh, more endpoints, it slows it down. If you enable JPA or use, for example, Hibernate as implementation, it slows down. If you activate metrics, it slows down. If you do add fan clients, which are automatically generated clients from interfaces, it slows down. Okay. So this here is like the worst case for the annotation processor. It has to process like 16, 60k beans, which are just empty. And empty beans are really fast in spring too, because they don't do all the expensive magic, which are listed here. So we are going to take a real benchmark later. But first, um, let me show you what Micronaut can bring to the table, what, what features are in Micronaut. So Micronaut, as a full stack developer framework, is um, doing dependency injection. Spring started with a dependency injection container. Micronaut also has dependency injection. We're going to take a look at it later. It also can write, you can write REST controllers, which are essentially reading JSON, writing JSON. You can, of course, support other formats. Um, you, you have an event bus, so you can annotate your stuff with event listener, and then you can throw events and process them somewhere else. It also has AOP, for example, if you need to wrap your service and check access to the service. It can do a validation, all the stuff you, 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 um, you are aware of Spring Boot, for example, um, at not null, at not empty, not blank, and stuff like that. It can do caching, it can do retrying if you want to build resilience applications, it can do circuit breaking, it can um, do fallbacks and recoveries. For example, if the service is failing, you see the, 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 um, the recovery service. It can also schedule beans, for example, call this bean every, every Monday on 9 a.m., for example. Um, you can choose between reactive programming and blocking programming. Uh, the underlying framework which they use is Netty. They have interesting features like compile time root validation. Um, so you can um, put your root parameters in the curly braces. And if you don't have a parameter which is named like the curly braces is, then it fails at compile time, which is interesting because Spring Boot, for example, fails at the runtime. It also has the all the exception handling stuff. It can web sockets. It can do server-side views. If you want to render all your HTML on, the, on your server, you can do with time leaf handlebars or velocity. It also supports open API um, documentation. The interesting thing here is the open eye spec is not generated on runtime, but it's actually generated on compile time, which is which is cool. It can also do the HTTP client stuff from Spring, which, which, um, what you might know from Spring Boot, the frame client. It can annotate an interface and let implement that. And I, I'm going to show that in our in our demo. It can do all the stuff like client-side load balancing, service discovery. It has integration into open tracing, so you get distributed tracings if you are building a microservice architecture. Um, all the fancy stuff reading from configuration files with different environments, multiple property sources, so you can, for example, override your configuration with um, environment values if you're running, for example, in Kubernetes. It's also uh, distributed config support with console and stuff like that. It has a nice database support for everything you your heart belong, for example, JPA or Mongo or Neo4j or even a Postgres reactive driver. <clears throat> All the monitoring, the monitoring story is of, 
is, is, is quite great because it has all the uh, health checks and um, readiness probes and stuff like that. You get metrics with micrometer. You can, for example, change the local at runtime if you are debugging hard problems on production. Um, it has a security layer, which is called Micronode Security, which is essentially like Spring Security with users and roles, so the role-based access control, all the basics, a basic out session-based stuff. And then um, it was advertised at serverless, so you can also run function as a service, which is um, targeting the AWS Lambda or Open OpenFast. So you can also do that. You can write message-driven applications, which are uh, for example, you consuming events from RapidMQ or Kafka. You can write CLI, CLI applications, which is interesting because this is not like um, targeted at the, the server developers, but you can write your CLI application and then compile it to a native image. And the, the, the documentation was quite good. So I started with Micronaut 1.0 and I read the documentation and it was really good. It has, for example, tutorials how to get an HTTPS certificate in there, um, how to start, for example, start console with a Docker image if you need um, distributed um, configurations and stuff like that. So I was really surprised that it's, that it's that it has a good documentation for such a new project. OK, but now I um, just tagged with you enough blah, blah. Now we are going to really take a look at how to develop Micronaut applications. And this application, we are going to benchmark later to see if it really starts faster than Spring and how it behaves at runtime, how many, how, how, how much throughput this application gets and how much memory, for example, or CPU usage this stuff is, is using. So the thing we are going to build is you have a, um, I have a browser. We are going to write this service, which has an HTTP server in it. We are going to write an HTTP endpoint, and then we are implementing an HTTP client, which is using a connection over the internet to github.com to fetch the most start projects and deliver them to the browser. So we can see the stack from the requests incoming. We, may, we, we create a new request and handle that stuff and send it back to the browser. The first thing we are going to do is creating the project. So Spring has the Spring Starter, or the Spring Initializer, it's called, it's start.spring.io. Micronaut has a CLI application to start to bootstrap your process. The CLI application you can install with SDK, SDK man, and then you have a command which is called mn for Micronaut. And if you start it, you, you see that this bootstraps your projects. And if you start it, it can create a, an app, your CLI app, function as a service, it even supports gRPC and or a message driven app. We are interested in create app, which is a little bit strangely named, but create app is essentially a server app. So it reads something from the internet and um, uh, responds to it. If we uh, type mn create app minus a dash dash help, you see that there you can say, for example, which build tool you want to use. So the stuff which is supported is Gradle, Gradle with the Kotlin DSL or Maven. And then you can put in features. Features is essentially the same which you can, which you know from, may know from Spring Boot, for example, you need a um, database connection pool. You need Flyway for database migrations. You need tracing with Jaeger. You need a GraphQL endpoint. You need velocity for view rendering. You need Hibernate JPA. You can specify all the feature stuff, and the bootstrapping tool is putting all that stuff in your POM or in your um, build.gradle file. OK, so I'm going to execute this command, which creates my app which is named demo, which I'm going to build with the Maven build tool. If you take a look at what is now in my demo folder, there is a readme. There is a, a small YAML file in which the CLI tool has um, put some information so that you can resume it later. Then there is the Maven wrapper. So you don't need to have in Maven install, just use the wrapper and download the Maven. You have the, the Maven uh, pump. And then you have one application, you have an application config file, you have the logging configuration, and then you have a test. And the first thing we are going to do is we are now creating an HTTP endpoint. So 
So an endpoint which someone can call and then we can do something with it. How do we do that stuff? The first thing is you create a new class and you annotate it with add controller and then you give it a path where the, this controller lives. So if you do a curl slash projects, this controller gets called. Then you put a method in it. The method is annotated with add get. So this responds to HTTP get. There is also add post, add delete and stuff like that. And then you write your code. And what I did here is I just created a Java class, which I named DTO for data transfer object. You see this here. It just contains a list of projects. Each project has a name and the number of stars. And then we just return something here. We return hello world with 12 stars and hello micronaut with one star. And now we can start it. Micronaut does all the stuff which it needs to do with its annotation processor. And then it starts up. And then you can run a curl to localhost 8080. And then you get back in JSON projects name hello world. So Micronaut is taking this thing here and automatically serializes it in JSON. Okay. And that's the basic stuff how you can write a controller. Okay. So this one. It's it's like if you know Quarkus or Spring Boot or even Jux RS, it's essentially the same with a little bit other annotations, but it's the same programming model. Annotate stuff magic and your your um, method gets called. OK, um, but we are developing a, a more scalable solution. That's, so we need a proper software architecture. So we are using dependency injection pattern. So what we are going to do is first create an interface, which I named project service. And this service has the, um, the responsibility to give us the projects, which it knows. And then we are going to implement this project service with our implementation class. And there, I just moved all the code from the controller here in it here. OK, this is the service. Now we have the service. Now we have to call this service from our controller. So I uh, fixed the controller. And this is the add get method from before. And here, I call uh, on the project service list projects. How does the project service now gets into the controller? And this is where the dependency injection comes in. You declare a field from type project service. You create a controller, uh, um, a constructor, sorry, a constructor which takes this project service annotated with add inject. This is, by the way, the jarcarta.inject. And Micronaut will then, at, at startup or compile time, we'll see, um, inject an instance of this interface here. So it searches for a class which implements this interface and then puts it here. We start in the field. We can call it here. We we use it here and call the method, which gets us the projects. OK, let's try that stuff. So we compile it. We execute that stuff. And we get a happy 500, 500 internal server error, which everyone loves. So something went wrong. What's the problem? If you take a look at your console, you see there is a message, no bean of type, something, something, something exists. So Micronaut complains that it does not find the bean which implements this interface. OK. What we have to do is we created this class, but just because we implemented this interface, Micronaut doesn't know your class. You have to annotate your class with, a, for example, at singleton. There's also at prototype, which creates a new bean every time. But at singleton, is it creates one bean, and this bean gets injected in all the injection points. Okay, so you may know this from, for example, um, Java E. In uh, Spring Boot, if you know Spring Boot, this, the um, add component is is the same. Add component is also a singleton. And with this annotation. You, Micronaut now finds your class and can inject this stuff into the controller. And if you do a curl now, the controller gets called, the service gets called, the projects are returned, and they are serialized into JSON. OK, so what's strange here is that they can't find that stuff to compile time. OK, it, it would be quite easy, I think, to find out at compile time that this interface has no implementation and just stop the compile process, but it doesn't. You can compile it, and it fades at runtime, 
which I find strange, and I have no idea why this is. But may as it be, um, if you need dependency injection, declare an interface, implement the class, put at singleton on it or another uh, scope which you need, and the micronaut does all the rest. And then it gets injected into a controller and you can use it. Okay. So fine. So this stuff, someone has implemented Firefox or some, something else. The internet, thankfully, got implemented by someone else. GitHub.com got implemented. We have implemented our HTTP server, and now we have to write our HTTP client. How do we create an HTTP client? Um, what we are going to call is the GitHub API. And the GitHub API has a search endpoint, which lets me search for repositories. And what I'm going to do is we search all repositories which have greater than one stars, and we sort it by stars, so that the most star repository shows up at the top. And then we get something like this, like total count, items, and there are a lot of items, which are the, the repositories which got started. Now we want to call that stuff. How do we do this? So we define an interface. We annotate it with add client. And here we put in the base URL. We put in an add get. And then um, we uh, put in there the, the URL, which got called. And we have to put an header in there, the user agent, because otherwise the GitHub API doesn't like us and give us an error that no user agent is specified. And here we are returning a VDO, which I'm going to show in the next slide. The interesting thing is we are not going to implement this interface. Okay, So Micronaut is implementing this interface at compile time. Micronaut will create code, which does all the HTTP calling stuff and JSON deserializing and stuff like that. And it creates that all that stuff at compile time. This is the DDO for, um, for reference. This is the thing here, which gets returned. And here you can use Jackson annotations. This is a JSON property from Jackson. You can map total underscore count to total count um, written in um, camel case. Okay, and the same here with star stargazes. Okay, now we have the client, which Micronauts implements at compile time. And then we can use this service here in our project service. So the project service, it had hard-coded projects, but I removed all that code. And we are instead going to dependency inject our GitHub client. This is the interface. And then we store it in a field. And then we can use it here. You can call fetch most star projects. And then the micronode generated code kicks in, does the HTTP request, deserializes it all from JSON into this class. And then you can this, use this class to do some streaming mapping stuff to get your project DTO. And then you can return this to the client. And then you have the whole round trip. If a request comes in, you call via the GitHub client, the API, transform the result, return the result, and Micronaut is serializing that stuff to JSON. And it gives you the spec. And if you call it, it just looks like this. Um, you, this really calls GitHub. So this is the whole stack from controller to um, to um, HTTP client and back. OK, let's take a look at caching so that you can see, um, for example, um, aspect-oriented programming in, in practice. You can add those two dependencies, which is the caching core dependency. And then you have to in, um, put in there a caching implementation for which I use caffeine, which is a well-known cache for Java. And you put at cacheable at cacheable and the cache name on your list project method from the service. And then you have to configure your cache. So this is the name of the cache. This one here and this one here are related. You say, okay, maximum size because I just returned one. That's that's fine. You say expire after write 10 seconds. And then you can execute it. If you executed it the first time, this the cache is called. Uh, so it's a cache miss. So it takes like uh, 800 milliseconds. And the next time, it just takes uh, 40 milliseconds. So you see, this caching works exactly like you expected it to. And what happens at compile time is Micronaut extends your class, um, overrides this list project method. It checks if 
the result is already in the cache. If yes, returns. If not, it calls super.list projects. And all that stuff is not done at runtime. So the proxy is not generated at runtime, but it's generated at compile time. That's, that's, the, that's the caching feature. OK, so the last feature which I'm going to show is the failure recovery, which, um, which you need if you want to build resilient systems. You can implement another fallback project service. This implements the same interface, and it just returns a hard-coded list. And you annotate this with at fallback. So Micronaut knows that if something goes wrong, it can call the fallback. It can call the fallback method. And then you need to annotate your project service with at recoverable. So Micronaut knows if this project service, this is the one which does the GitHub call, um, fails, then please use the fallback project service and just call this method and use this stuff. And um, I removed the internet to test this stuff, and then I called it. And, and then the original service fails. It logs the reason why it fails. And then it calls the fallback service. And here you get the hard-coded list of fallback projects, which is from this, this one here. And if you take a look how this is implemented, it's implemented the, right, the, the, the same way. You have a project service, which is, which is um, extended here. And then it essentially does a try catch. And if it catches an exception, it logs the exception and it called the callback, uh, the fallback service. And all that code is generated at compile time. OK, so I'm going to skip this and this. And we are now going to take a look. So we have implemented our service, which when we call it, it goes to the GitHub API and it does some caching. And it would be now interesting to implement the whole stuff in Micronaut and in Spring Boot, and then we can compare those. So I did this, and I this is um, Micronaut 2.2. .2. Um, Micronaut 3 got released, uh, I don't know, four, four days ago or something like that. But this is um, the Micronaut 2.2 .2 version. And you can build it. And if you build it, it builds in three seconds. So it's not that the annotation processor is, is very, very slow. It's, 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 it's OK. So there is no performance problems with the annotation processor. The annotation processor just takes a long time if you put like 16,000 classes in there. But that's a really, really big application. And then you start it, and it really starts in uh, 600 milliseconds. OK, so the whole application with a controller, with the service dependency injection stuff, with the cacheable, and with the GitHub client, which is generated which from the interface, it starts in 600 milliseconds, which is not that bad. If you build that stuff in Spring, it's Spring 2.4, not the 2.5 one, but uh, should be OK. If you build all that stuff with a fame client as HTTP client, you'll see that it starts in 1.2 seconds. OK, so it's a little bit slow. If we take a look at the char size, the char size from Micronaut has like 15 megabytes. And this is a screenshot from the visual VM. So I profiled it stuff a little bit. And you'll see that the, the used um, memory here is like 56, 56 megabytes. If you do um, a benchmark with uh, WRK, which is benchmark tool, um, you see that this thing here with um, I think I, ga I gave it 512 megabyte of heap. Um, is is doing like 90,000 requests per second, which should be enough. If you do the same thing with Spring Boot, so the same application, the jar file is like 30, uh, 30 megabytes, so it's um, two or two and a half times bigger the um, the jar. And the used the, the the used heap you see here, it's um, on like after a garbage collection 30, but it peaks to like 80, and here it peaks to like 80 or 90. So they are roughly comparable from the usage of the, the RAM when running. If we are doing the same benchmark against the Spring Boot application, and here you see the, the Spring Boot application is doing uh, um, 72,000 uh, requests compared to the 92,000 requests from Micronaut. So it's 20,000 less, but yeah, it's, it's dead enough. 
So then I got interested in how much RAM do I have to use? So Micronaut, maybe they, they use less RAM if I put down the heap. So I tested it. I started it with 32 megabytes of heap. And it starts and it works. So this is just 32 megabytes of heap. And it still does 57,000 requests per second. I tried the same with Spring. And Spring also works. And it, it does like 30,000 requests. So it's you can compress the heap down to to like 32 megabytes and it still works so there are more more um, benchmarks but um in every benchmark micronaut is essentially faster than spring boot from the startup time and from the the throughput okay but on memory side they are roughly comparable the same okay so another interesting thing is the Giralvia. Not sure of a, if you heard of it, but the Graal VM is a lot. It's a high performance polyglot VM. More um, languages like Ruby and Erlang and stuff like that on top of the of the of the Graal VM. But the I, I think the most important thing is the AOT compiler, which essentially takes your Java bytecode and outputs a native image. This is native compiled to your to your architecture, and you can run it without having access to a JVM. So you don't need a JVM to run it. It's very interesting. But one of the big pain points with Graal VM is uh, reflection stuff. So if you do reflection stuff, the Graal VM closed uh, world analysis doesn't find the class. It doesn't include it into your native image and then fails at runtime. But Micronaut says they are not doing reflection. So it should be theoretically possible to compile that stuff into a native image. So I just first installed the Gray VM, the Graal VM with um, SDK, with the SDK main tool, then I installed the native image tool, and then you can run Grail W native image, and all that stuff um, is now it's bootstrapping the Graal VM, it's compiling all your stuff to native image. And two minutes later, so it takes like two minutes and a lot of RAM to generate a native image from your Java bytecode. Then it outputs an application file, which is just called application. Um, and here you can, um, I, I use the file tool from, from Linux to see what is this thing. And here you see it's really a 64-bit executable compiled for Linux. Okay, So this thing does not need a JVM to run. You can just run it. It has 62 megabytes in it. So it's 62 megabytes big and then you can just run it if you take a look at against which libraries the stuff links it's like the, the stuff which you normally have on your system like libc uh, libp thread and stuff like that so it doesn't need any jvm libraries or stuff like that it just links against your linux system and then you can run it without jvm which is quite cool what's even cooler is when you see how fast this thing starts Okay, the startup completed in 67 mega, uh, milliseconds. So it takes 67 milliseconds to start the whole application, and then you can fire requests against it. Okay, if you start it, it takes like 92 megabytes of um, of RAM from your Linux system, and if you um, put it under load, you have uh, 700 and something megabyte used. Okay, so it's 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 really cool if you need. Um, Fast startup with Java application, maybe you should take a look at the Graal VM stuff because the Graal VM it essentially compiles your Java bytecode to a native image, and this native image is really fast. It starts up really fast. So I did a benchmark against the native image, and you see the throughput from this native image is a little bit less than, or it's not a little bit, but it's less than the JVM stuff because uh, the JVM also does runtime optimizations and stuff like that. Um, but the Graal VM team is working on that so that this stuff uh, even gets faster in a native image. So Graal VM is a really cool tool. Uh, to be fair, um, Spring is also working on Graal VM compatibility with uh, the Spring native project, which is essentially doing all magic that the Spring can work together with the Graal VM, so you can, in the future, compile a Spring application into a native image. 
which is quite cool. OK, so to conclude all that stuff, we did a project with Micronaut, and these this are the conclusions from that. So the, on the pro side, the service starts really faster than Spring Boot, so this um, works. The jar files are smaller, which is cool if you um, like smaller Docker images. The tests are faster because the embedded server, which you start for integration testing, starts faster. But you have to say Spring mitigates this with application context caching. So if you don't uh, fiddle with the context in Spring, it reuses the same context, and then it's at least as fast. On the Contra side, there is you can't separate management and API port, which is a problem if your security uh, if your security guys tell you you have to separate management and API ports, then you can't use Micronaut. Um, Spring Boot is more common, so there is more documentation, more block flows, more Stack Overflow answers, because Spring Boot is just the big kid on the block for that stuff. And I think the extension story from Spring Boot is better. We, um, for example, needed OAuth 2 with token refreshes, and it turns out Micronaut security has not implemented that stuff, so we had to implement it ourself, but um, your mileage may vary. If you need, um, if you don't need this, give it a try. So the conclusion, it has really good documentation. I really like the Micronaut documentation. I recommend it for at least try it out for small services because I have no experience with bigger services. So our services were like one microservices, one business domain, and it works out. But maybe you put like 30,000 classes in there, and then it's really slow. I don't know. Um, if you have experiences writing big services in Micronaut, please contact me. I would be, I would be very interested. The development is fun and um, good documentation. It starts fast. It's it's just um, no no frills development. It doesn't go into your way. And if the features are sufficient, just try it out. Um, to to the Graal VM, um, if you get it to run, it's really really cool. So the Graal VM native image is a really cool piece of technology. But be aware, this is not a JVM, OK? So if this stuff crashes in production, you get a heap dump. You, you don't get heap dumps. You get uh, a core dump from your Linux system. And then you have to use all the, the fancy C++ tools to find the stacks, traces, and stuff like that, OK? Also, the profilers uh, won't work with a native image. Okay. Just, it just isn't there. The build time from native image, it's like, like it's C++, so 30 seconds and upward. And not all libraries are compatible. So you can't take any Java application and compile it to native image. Um, the, the libraries have to be compatible with GraalVM, or at least don't do any dirty reflection matching and stuff like that. And then maybe it works, so just you have to try it out. For example, I ran into a trouble with the caffeine cache, where the reflection stuff isn't working. I created a GitHub issue and also put in a workaround there. So I got it compiled in the long run, but it was a little bit of a hassle to get this native image started. But if it's working, it's really, really great piece of technology, the Grand VM native image. It's really cool. If you are now interested in more stuff, you can take a look at our GitHub repo and take a look at the Micronaut documentation or take a look at the Graal VM. The Graal VM is a really cool piece of technology. You should at least give it a try. OK, and now I'm open for questions. Hello, Moritz. Thank you very much. Very interesting and uh, down to the point. So thanks for that. Uh, we do have questions, so let me scroll through them. Um, hmm, let's start with that one. So um, is Micronaut compatible with OpenGDK? Yes, you can just run um, Micronaut on any JVM which passes the JVM. Um, well, test. Okay. You can run it on every JVM. OK. And then um, Conrad is asking, does Micronaut support Spring AOP implementation? Um, I'm not sure. Micronaut has some Spring interoperability, but I'm not sure if the Spring AOP stuff is working in Micronaut. Could be. I have not tested it. OK. And the next one. Uh, Bo is asking, are there any use cases when not to use Micronaut? I mean, you've pointed out some on the last slides, but maybe some general things like use cases where you would say, OK. Um, so Micronaut 
um, uses um, reactive programming model inside their own classes. So if you have to extend Micronaut and you hate the reactive programming model, stay away from Micronaut because then you have to use this, um, the, the reactive model. If you're just writing stuff in your own controllers, you don't have to, to use it, annotate it with app blocking or how is this annotation called. And all the stuff is working like in non-reactive applications. But if you have to go into the core of Micronaut and for ex for extension, uh, for example, build an OAuth to token refresh, you have to uh, use reactive programming. And if you don't like that, stay away from Micronaut. OK, fair enough. Then uh, Martin Jacob is asking, can Micronaut generate WSDL like Spring do? I have not worked with XML-based services, so I have no expertise if this, if this can generate uh, WSDLs. OK. Um, someone with the name Gitmaster is, is asking, how is Micronaut different to Quarkus, uh, performance, memory, and so on? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. They um, essentially occupy the same space. They are both um, a Spring Boot competitor and are marketed toward fast startup. And uh, Quarkus also had the Graal native VM image. Sorry. They are not related. They are the, the, the same product from two different vendors, essentially. So I guess you would use Quarkus if you like Java EE. And you use Micronaut if you don't like Java. OK. Um, Clara is asking if you provide hands-on workshops on Micronaut. Yeah, just contact me, and we I guess we can work something out. My email address okay. is on this slide here. Uh, so let's put up the slides maybe again, just yep. asking the stage. It's, it's my so, name, moritz.camera at qr.de. OK, and Ivan, who has been engaged the whole day, is asking, uh, less, memo less memory is out of the box compared to Spring Native, only tweaks or you extend? Not sure if I get the question, but maybe it was uh, about the benchmarks, if it is out of the box or if you have to tweak it first. Um, so these, this thing here, um, I, I set the max um, the max heap uh, memory, but I, I didn't tweak the application somehow here. If you take a look at the native image and I run it, I didn't tweak that. I, I, I didn't set any max memories or and I didn't deploy any tweaks. So this is out of the box memory usage. I, I'm not sure if this answers the question. Okay, so Ivan, if, if it's... Uh... Not the answer you expected, and just uh, tell us again. Um, then another question. I think it's the last one. Uh, mm -hmm. How big is the adoption of Micronaut on the market? Is it future proof? Um, so I think it's yeah, quite, quite new, right? Yeah, it's it's not that new, but it's compared to Spring and Java E, it's really really new. Um, that's. I think that's the biggest problem with all the Spring Boot and Java E containers that they are relatively new, and you have to you have to believe the vendors that this stuff is supported and is the next big thing in Java server space. So it's it's hard to say. We did a project with Micronaut, and our project was successful, and it worked because the documentation was great. But of course, it doesn't have the same reach as Spring Boot. So I think every problem you will run to with Spring Boot is solved somewhere in Stack Overflow or you find a blog post. You could run into problems with Micronaut where you have to find the solution yourself and didn't find it on Stack Overflow. That's always a problem. But we okay. we we hadn't big problems with Micronaut, so everything works. Okay, thank you, Moritz, for answering all of these questions. Um, is there anything else you would like to share with the community? Um, I will maybe looking for, for new colleagues for reinforcement in your team. Yeah, um, we are always looking for um, highly motivated software engineers or architects. Check out our website. It's qaver.de. Uh, okay. Um, take a look. So you heard it. And uh, Ivan just let us say, no, he was not asking if you cheated. He was uh, asking, like, how do you decrease memory usage? That was the question that he meant. Um, you, you mean in, 
I, I'm not sure if I get the question. Maybe you, you mean this drop here? I, I, collect, I, I did a um, garbage collection. But if we are taking on uh, talking about how to generally reduce memory usage, this is a quite wide field, and I can't give any. <laughs> um, yeah, it would be. We can do this in another in the next session. Yeah. <laughs> okay, then Moritz, uh, thank you so much. Um, I okay. hope you enjoyed it as well as the audience did. So I uh, hope to see you soon again, maybe also at a physical event. Um, and uh, have a nice evening. And for everyone else, if you have other questions to, to Moritz, you can find his uh, social profiles also on the event page. Yeah. So just click through and get in touch with him. Cool. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye, Moritz. Bye bye. So that was our last uh, session of the Java Day. Uh, it was super interesting. And it was also super interesting to see all of your questions and uh, follow the, the discussion in the chat. So thanks for that. Um, like um, there is one guy who really uh, kind of um, got my um, impression. It was uh, Ivan. So Ivan, thank you for staying the whole day with us and asking so many questions and being active in the chat. Uh, please drop us an email with your mailing address to hello at realdevelopers.com and we will send you some of the one of the mana schnitten here. Hope you will like it if you like sweet stuff. So um, and with that we are slowly coming to an end. There is two more things that I would like to share with you. First of all, this was um, our first uh, Rio Developers Live Day after the summer break. It was the Java Day. I hope you enjoyed it. But there is more to come. So in two weeks, we have the JavaScript day. Then we have the cloud day. And then at the end of September, we have the database day and so on and so on and so on. So stay tuned. Check out regularly our website as we are also adding more and more sessions here. And uh, also, if you are looking for a job, for a software developer job or anything tech related, um, visit realdevelopers.com. You will find thousands of jobs there. Maybe there is something uh, for you. And uh, many of the jobs also have upfront salary information, so you can scan a bit the market. And with that said, I would just last time say um, thank you for your loyalty. Thanks for watching and tune in for the next time. Bye bye. Have you found your dream job as a developer? Or are you stuck in an unfulfilling job? On wearedevelopers.com, you find over a thousand jobs in Europe that fit the tech stack that you want to work with, and salaries go up to 130K. All you have to do is create a free profile, and you automatically get matched with jobs that fit your requirements. So what are you waiting for? Create your free profile and let companies apply to you now.